after the Hunter, Bi- Hunter Biden affair? <laughs> well, we're going. Aren't we, off? <laughs> we, aren't are... we are aren't we going against Facebook and Twitter now? Wait, hold on. What's going on here? It says live streaming isn't available right now. What? Are you Facebook? nuts? Hold on. Hold on. No, no. Now it says it's connection. Facebook. Well, something's going on. No, well, this isn't Facebook. This is YouTube. So I'm trying to see uh, what is going on. Oh, I think we are live. There we go. Excellent. Welcome, everybody, to another BTR stream. I am your host, Lev Polyakov, at Levpo on Twitter. This is going to be one of those panels that's just like that uh, Tim and Eric sketch about the universe, where Eric Wareheim <laughs> goes like, <laughs> so we have, oh boy yes elliot c says it is working fine excellent so here we go so we have so many amazing people here today we have alexander bard philosopher co-author of digital libido sex power and violence in the network uh, society and uh, songwriter music producer youtuber just an all-around amazing person alexander welcome and we have a newcomer joel davis Welcome, Joel Davis. It is a great pleasure to have you here with us. And uh, you are also a, uh, a futurist philosopher, if that's the right way to say it. And we also have uh, joining us today, uh, again, the great John Pellich. Welcome, John. And we also have the great Logo Daedalus joining, as well as the amazing Hello. Giovanni Penichetti. So welcome, everybody. For the newcomers here, I would say that that would be uh, Joel Davis Uh, Could you tell us a little bit about yourself for the people who are not as familiar? Um, Okay, so I guess I just kind of started hanging out on YouTube and Twitter in the dissident right scene, I guess you could say, although it's kind of a strange term, I guess, Um, maybe about four years ago, three years ago. And um, we just kind of started really nerding out about theory because uh, we started kind of calling into question um, I guess a lot of like the mainstream cookie cutter ideologies that were available. And so that meant we had to go down this long path of research. Um, and uh, I guess the way that we see it, at least in my scene, because we have like a kind of a scene, I guess, that I'm a part of, uh, we kind of see it as, okay, well, you know, liberalism is fundamentally flawed and we'd like to see some kind of new political movement emerge obviously with like neo reaction and um, um, various other kind of discourses emerging on the dissident right there is some kind of new stuff that's being said uh, that hasn't really been said before um, that's kind of emerged over the last 10 years or so in these spaces Um, and we're kind of we're trying to say okay how do we take those ideas and run with them and try and complexify them and then relate them to some kind of praxis and try and build some kind of post-liberal, uh, you know, viewpoint uh, with which we can look upon, you know, the kind of condition that we find ourselves in politically um, through new eyes that it's kind of updated for the 21st century rather than just kind of falling back to some traditionalist viewpoint or taking a kind of just a simply antagonistic position or, or what have you. Um, I, you know, because obviously historically, um, all the great um, kind of political changes that have occurred, or at least better political changes um, that are kind of majorly significant, come along at, with a bunch of fresh new ideas. So one of the most critical aspects of what we're doing is how do you actually have new ideas? How do you be creative? Um, how, do, how do you innovate? Um, and so philosophers like Deleuze uh, and, and Heidegger, um, these are very important philosophers to me because they deal with this question, I think, quite a lot, how to innovate, but also within history. So I guess maybe that's how it relates um, to today's topic. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm really a futurist. I mean, I, I guess you could say that it's kind of an empty term. Um, I don't you're, really know. You're not a transhumanist. Uh, well, you know, with the transhuman transhumanism question is, uh, for me, it is what it is. I mean, I I think a lot of things associated with transhumanism are kind of disgusting uh, and AI is a bit of a meme, but there's got to be some kind of technological uh, augmentation of the species that occurs at some point, I think. So I think it's a matter of trying to manage that process rather than um, just something like pro anti or or whatever position. Um, I think it requires a little bit more uh, complexity than that. A turning cop idea. Is uh, Joel uh, Justin Murphy's long-lost cousin? 
<laughs> by the way, by the way, before we before we keep going, I completely forgot to say to all the people who are watching here, 83 people. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget wow. to subscribe. Don't forget to subscribe. Subscribe right now. You are not going to regret it. We are one of the greatest, most underrated streams, and we are taking over. Anyway, that being said, and also Patreon. Subscribe to Patreon. Yes, Patreon. Find our Patreon. Get gets a print from the that Fun No GF series. An amazing print. Throw it up on the screen. Love. I'm going to throw it up on the screen right now. So uh, I want to rewind the clock a bit and ask people here, how do you even define history to begin with? So let's start from uh, Alexander. Okay, uh, I call it the root of the phallus. <laughs> I mean, Hitch, uh, Freud talked a lot about the phallus, but he didn't, he didn't study the phallus in detail. I think we should uh, actually. And, and uh, uh, you know, the top of the phallus is obviously where we're heading or at least try to head vertically. Uh, it's like we want to create a better world or something superior to what we already have because we already have what we already have. So either we stay with a repetition of the same forever, which is like Nietzsche's nightmare, or uh, as Zoroaster discovered 4,000 years ago, we could actually improve on the world simply because of information accumulation. And, and uh, that's the idea to get further ahead. But actually, if you think of phallic direction, if you think of, okay, so, uh, well, we're, we're, doing a, we're doing a webcast here right now where actually there's a guy reporting in front of the Tower of Babel. I mean, it's, 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 not, like, it's not like you're having mediocre, sort of modest phallic ambitions here. Let's put it that way. Because we're going to do the Tower of Babel right this time, right? But uh, I would say the root of the phallus, um, at least when it comes to the masculine way of interpreting history, which is not the repetition of the same, which is not Hinduism. Uh, it is, you're building, you're, you're spending a lot of time on the basement towards building a skyscraper of dreams, right? So that's why I refer to history as the root of the phallus. You can also call it big history or deep history these days because of data and data anthropology. We can actually find out much more about history than we ever could in the past. We've been guessing about history until now. Now we can actually define history categorically and factually, which is and uniquely, we've never done that before. Uh, but I, I would say the root of the phallus is a philosophical term for finding a history that is so solid and so grounded that you can actually build a skyscraper based on it. And this is what I think is very, very important when we talk about phallic ambition and phallic dreams, which we'll, we've been lacking. Nick Land agrees with me. We were lacking this since 1945. We haven't had any dreams at all to speak of. And now we need to talk about utopias or protopias, if you prefer that term, but what kind of society could we really create and what kind of man versus machine relationship could there really be? What kind of symbiotic transcendence are we really talking about here? And to do that, we need to go deeper down into our history. And that to me is sociobiology more than anything else. Um, every one of us carries with us the memory of all of mankind, the past at least 200,000 years with us in our genes. And on top of the amazing information storage that our genetics is, which is who we are, the archetypology, what kind of men or what kind of women or what kind of androgynous or fantastic shamanic creatures are we? On based on that, on that sort of tribal structure, we can then dream and start dreaming about what we, what we could really achieve when the machine comes up to ask us in about 20 to 30 years time and asks us, who are you humans? In what way can you contribute to what I want to do? And I think that's the root of the phallus is the name for history. Logo, do you agree? Or do you have a different uh, I way? don't know what any of that meant. It sounded like the plot of Assassin's <laughs> Creed to me, honestly. <laughs> okay, how would you define history? Let's start with that. Uh, so I don't like history. What is history? But really, ultimately, the historiography of historiography, right? History is just a concept we have used to mean a lot of different things over time. What you can actually get out of it is seeing what the differences over time is in the interpretation of history itself, right? That's what history really is. Because we look, we go deep on history. What does the word even mean? What is the Greek root of the word historian? It just means a witness. It just means a testimony. And, and when we specifically mean history, we don't particularly mean the oral legends of myth. We mean the written documentation of history. So it's particularly like a scribal medium. It's particularly an alphabetic effect. Um, it is not just this thing that exists in our genes, I don't think. I think the uh, sociobiological uh, way uh, about uh, it no. is completely backwards. No, 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 no. Hey, don't talk about backwards and forwards here, please. I mean, that's, 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 that's <laughs> I mean, is it, is, I'm saying you're, you got to get the balls, my dude. Yeah. 
Okay. We're talking about the root of the phallus. Let's no. get to the balls here. Okay. That's pathic. That's <laughs> pathic. What you're talking about is mythical history. Yes, that's correct. It's a good, but it's only that's one out of three histories. No, it's one out of three histories. You have two other histories. One is logical, uh, the, the logos history. And the, the third one is pathos, the history of pathos. And, and we are three, the three different histories we talk about here. And you cannot, this is very Hegelian. You cannot talk about it in a sort of, a sort of uh, relativist, postmodernist way that there's only stories on stories on stories and certain witnesses said certain things. That's just ridiculous. There's way more interest in that and with data, we can actually show that as well. And we also have that memory in our own bodies, which is the pathical narrative that our bodies tell us who we are. So are, do you believe in like, you have like dream, like Alex Jones talks about having dreams of his ancestors and he's like living his life. Is that what you mean when you say no, we have the no, memory no. of our ancestry? I don't no, know what that means. No, that's ultra mythical. Memory that's like the, uh, no, that wait the, a second. Now yeah. I say your genes, your genetic makeup, your brain, your, your kidneys, your heart, all these organs are there. And you're kind of a winner. You're an evolutionary winner because you do exist. Okay. So there are 7 billion people like this on the planet right now, all humans who have a memory in the sense that their bodies have been formed over hundreds of thousands of years. And that means we're all social biology. We're remnants of social biology. And that's not a made up history made by some fucking college kid in America. Or well, who like makes up, who creates social like biology? We didn't always have sociobiology. Like where's the origins of this? Like doesn't sociobiology have its own history? Is that a pathic history, a logical history? You're mixing up an academic discipline with the actual nature of things. They're two totally different things. I'm saying you're okay. I'm okay with your description, but you only talk about mythical narrative. And if that's all that history, history is also time, it's process. It's it is time. I'll give yes. you that. It's yeah. human. It's the human conception of time though. It's not time no, itself. No, no, there is an absolute time. There's nothing to do with humans that existed long before we existed as well. How do you have access to that? I don't saying I have access to it. I'm not a... Can we get at least get beyond Immanuel Kant and some decent sort of no? We can't. That's number one. <laughs> Wait, before we go That's further, the problem. John, you had something you yeah. wanted to say. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit, I'm way slower than these two guys just right now, but um, I'd say if you, you know, you have uh. The, in terms of talking about the, these, these, uh, the not not to use your terms incorrectly, but ancestral memories, it it, it is a uh, very similar to the way that uh, Freud talks about the super ego, uh, where he says it literally is like this uh, kind of concentration of, uh, I mean, li almost literally your ancestors. Although he, uh, of course, talks about the super ego in in, in terms that are more relatable to the. Uh, general dynamic of psychoanalysis but uh it's hard for me to directly like address i mean i i think that uh alexander bard is being purely metaphorical i don't think there's anything wrong with that yeah it's mythological um, that's fine but it's but but history. um and in terms of of logos uh d definition of history i mean I, I i think i actually pretty generally agree with it i i would say that i would kind of define it from a different angle or talk about it from a different angle which would be it's pretty similar to asking like to define art, art or define consciousness because art and consciousness and history are so much about the content of the events or the aesthetics or the works or the moments of history themselves that there is very, very little and what little you can actually say about history is really important and very, very difficult to describe if I can do my best to carefully define things and I'm not trying to be some sort of like, like a uh, troll or something, but I actually really don't think it's really that good to even define things on the on outset. But, um, but I, I would say that it's probably at least, yeah, human, uh, human understanding of others coming together with uh, time as like being understood. Yeah, good. So all of those things are like tied together in the concept of time. And it's specifically the shared time of that exists in social relations. So mm -hmm. this is actually like the bedrock of like social ontology, right? Which is the idea that this shared time that we ex share through uh, language, through consciousness in art, expression, uh, any sort of artifacts that are created from consciousness are part of this network of relations.
that's like the bedrock of social ontology. And all of this is what's unique about it is that um, this understanding is that it actually has to take place in time and in corporeal action. It's not this abstract thing. So I see people in the comments saying that I don't believe that rocks exist before geology. That was our patron no, that's caustic. Not, that's not really quite what I'm saying here. I'm saying that the concept of say different types of minerals with their different classifications and their hardnesses, the scales, the way that we look at things geologically, the concept of looking at rocks as a geological matter, as opposed to um, like the teeth of the giants from the deluge or however people were looking at, at uh, understanding like the origin of like boulders and things uh, under like mythical history as opposed to like geological history. Yeah, absolutely. People didn't have a concept of like a glacial shift or something like that um, before geology and this sort of uh, investigation existed. Yeah, but the, the fact that you're aware of something doesn't mean it couldn't have existed before you became aware of it. That's too solipsistic. Right? No, no, no. I'm not saying me personally. Okay. I'm saying social okay. relations. I'm talking about the like yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. anyone okay. became We're aware talking about different histories here. That's that's fine. So cosmic background radiation is clearly pathical. It is something that exists in nature, and we logically try to interpret it. As far as anybody trying to do mythos out of cosmic sure. background radiation, it's probably crap. But let's but let's crappy. let's put it this way. If so you this have way, your... that's why I talk about three different like, ways of doing narrative to begin with. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Yeah. But let's yeah, say you right. took your, you're talking about cosmic background radiation. Okay, let's say you take that information and somehow you have this information and you go back in time 2000 years and you try fucking explaining that to fucking anyone. Does it actually exist for these people in that time in a meaningful sense? Like, no. Well, like, yeah, you time say is it's also time fact, is also like but for history is only the understanding of time. It's not actually nearly necessarily time. No, the question is, what's well, the difference? It's, it's we're mixing, the we're mixing, up, we're mixing well. up ontology with rhetorics here. It's just like what if people understand something you explain to it, it's a way of saying, this is a rhetorical quest of how we're going to present something on a stage. That's completely different from history itself. Well, right? I mean, but, but when, if, if I may, like history as, as it is now, for the most part, doesn't function as like time timelines in which we like besides some modern history and like you know things like events that happened recently recently in with, within mass media we don't necessarily have like a sense of each hour and and the true like tech like moment in which things took place it's really it's still chronological like in which we only think of events relatively taking place before and after each other and that but that's really human of, invention like that's no, no, I'm saying I'm agreeing that that's human invention, but I'm saying that's 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 the the way in which time in this case, it, I agree, I think I agree with the logo and if maybe I'm agreeing incorrectly, but that time in this case really is in terms of history is being defined through something that's that's that is very much having to do more with the way in which causality comes into its relationship with time rather than like no, no, it's, it's, it's way more than that. I work with physicists all the time. So we're working with a model right now here in Europe uh, on two time dimensions because it's actually required. Apparently since Baudrillard's equation in 2011, the big bang never happened, it was a big bounce, okay? If you remove the infinities from mathematics, which were cheating all along, then you discover that there's no infinity in terms of energy. So that means the big bang never happened, it was a big bounce. And if it was a big bounce, space time starts to occur after the big bang, big bounce, Okay, mind you, uh, that means there must be another temporal dimension, at least two, possibly three that we're working with. And the interesting thing is that hyper times is called, which is necessary, not necessarily hyperspace, although it could help to think to use hyperspace, but hyper time definitely is there. And the fact that hyper time and time as we know it, which is space time, which has space with it tied to the time, operate in different ways. And the discrepancies between the two actually is what creates the first relation. So you can build the white Teddy and relationalism based on this, which is what physicists are actually thrilled about right now. This includes guys like Smalin, Suskind, all these other guys right now. So after 2011, things have actually dramatically changed. And um, the, I find it very interesting because we have philosophers that talk about different time dimensions. There could be duration and time like Bergson talks about it because this is interesting to artists. But I think, again, it's important to separate it's different time dimensions in the mythical sphere, which is where Bergson talks about when he argues with Einstein, but actually they're looking at in physics or actually sub-physics, what we're doing now, which is prior to physics itself. We then discovered the mathematical formula that said, oh, oh, hyper time has some really weird loops to it. You could actually talk about this, maybe not as nonlinear, 
but actually it's very curved and weird and strange. Whereas actually space time as we know it is just expanding. It really is very, very linear and has been linear for almost 14 billion years. And that is the frame onto which everything else is tied in physics, chemistry, biology, and consciousness. I want to get to uh, Joel. Joel, you have a a series on uh, Bergson's creative evolution. So would you want to add anything to uh, what Alexander was talking about right now? Yeah, well, I actually have a series on Bergson's time and free will, matter and memory, and creative evolution. It's kind of continuous. Um, But I think this debate over how do we define history is kind of in a certain sense, uh, not really getting at, I think what is more interesting, which is how, I guess like the history of the concept of history, I guess Logo was kind of trying to go down this path at one point, which is that how we view our, I mean, if you see history in a certain sense as a kind of a model that we inhabit, I think, uh, you know, this is a fair enough basic way of describing it. And so, how we understand our relation to the model and the structure of the model changes our understanding of our historical uh, context, so to speak, right? And so I think if you look at, um, you know, history of Western metaphysics and Western culture, you see these like changes in, in our relation to time as having, I think, very, you know, major historical uh, implications and I think this is why we have something like an end of history that we're even contemplating so even if you go all the way back to Plato and you look at um, you know basically Plato privileging being over becoming and projecting you know the idea into these in this kind of like detemporalized dimension outside of history um, in a certain sense he is kind of denying history in this way and and, and this is I think the source of a lot of uh, the West's um, you know, anti-historical perspectives. But if you look at what Plato is doing within history, Plato is not just doing this for the sake of it, he's trying to respond to the problems of sophistry and tyranny um, that as as he sees them, or at least him and Socrates see them in as as the central kind of moral problematic of the social and political environment in which they lived at the time. And so the detemporalization of the idea was, you know, in a certain sense, a way of, oh, we need to take these concepts and project them outside of history because within history, we don't know how to make sense of them. And we're getting kind of smashed with sophists and, and tyrants and we don't know what else to do. Um, and so you, it seems like you have this kind of common thread throughout the West where you have to create these, you know, basically anti-temporal or, or atemporal bureaucracies that we constantly try and project out of history. And in so doing, we try and explain the world in ways in which we get outside and behind time, and this I guess relates to Bergson, uh, get outside and behind time with which to set a whole bunch of transcendent or transcendental at least conditions under which we can kind of regulate uh, the becoming of, you know, the becoming of our understanding within time. And I think the kind of key move that Bergson makes that ultimately people like Heidegger and, and, and Deleuze later in the 20th century kind of take their cues from is privileging time over space you know Bergson's point is that as soon as you start intellectualizing and and, and kind of creating this kind of geometrical conception of time you're no longer talking about time you're talking about space and so you're already kind of presupposing um, a whole bunch of intervals that the intellect inserts into temporality uh, which you then reify and then you try to then derive time as a kind of secondary phenomena out of that you're, you're running into a mistake because and you get all these metaphysical problems um, you know, there's a reason why Kant's, you know, uh, philosophy runs into all these antinomian uh, kind of, I mean, he at least admits them, but it runs into all these antinomian paradoxes because he's privileging the geometrical over, you know, what Bergson would see as the vital, which is something that can only really express itself temporally and necessarily prior to kind of um, a kind of spatial um, representation of the world. And and my contention, though, is that it's not just like a metaphysical point, but this is actually a moral problem, like a political problem, uh, and therefore a deeply historical problem, because we need to keep doing, like Kant isn't just doing metaphysics because he wants to have the best metaphysics. Kant is responding to uh, moral problems. How do we have science and Christianity and ethics and fit them all together in a way that's coherent and works? And we've got problems in Western philosophy that he's coming out of, obviously, with like skepticism from Hume and so forth problematizing 
a whole bunch of moral ideas, a whole bunch of religious ideas, and he's trying to fit all these things together. He's a, you know, he's a kind of bureaucrat in the same way that Plato was trying to project some kind of, instead of a transcend, his innovation is instead of having a transcendent bureaucracy, you have a transcendental bureaucracy, but in the same sense, that's what he's doing. Um, and so I think this is the really interesting question because we get to this point now where we have this idea of the end of history in the West and only a kind of attitude in which we try to project our moral values. If you think about something like human rights, uh, the core of liberalism, we try and project these values outside of time. If you read like the, you know, the um, UN Declaration on Human Rights, there is no explanation for where the fuck these rights actually came <laughs> from, how they were created. Exactly. They don't have a history. Um, they just somehow float in this transcendent position and that just manifest themselves through talking yeah. about them. Um, and, and, and this is generally the Western attitude, um, at least the bureaucratic Western attitude that I think is at the core of so much of what goes wrong. And while we run into these kinds of stagnated roadblocks where we think, oh, yes, we've completed history or what have you. I mean, ironically, Hegel gets associated with all of this end of history stuff. And I guess in a certain way, certain things that he wrote uh, make him culpable. But I think at least with Hegel, he does temporalize the idea. He does understand the idea as being embedded within a history and a, and a kind of dialectical progression and so forth. And so I think at least within Hegel's system, um, you know, you have the capacity to demonstrate, okay, if if there is more to come from wherever we're at, you know, in terms of the political discourse, the moral discourse in the West right now, history can continue. Um, and I think the moment in which that was confirmed, at least in my perspective, ironically, is uh, near reaction. I mean, people might think, okay, why the hell do you think mold bugs are Hegelian? That's ridiculous. I don't, I mean, obviously that's kind of ridiculous to say it like that. But if you look at like mold bugs writings, uh, Moldbug begins as a libertarian, right? Uh, so uh, there's no, you can't get more liberal than a libertarian. They're like the most pure autistic, li uh, you know, liberal you can get. <laughs> the most rarefied uh, version of a libertarian. Of a liberal, yeah, 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 right. Uh, but then he says, okay, well, but what, what confused him originally was that, okay, well, why the fuck were we more free under a monarchy than we are under a democracy? You know, why was, you know, prior what was like before liberalism we were freer than we are now I, I read an interesting article the other day about how under feudalism we had like a hundred days off if you're a peasant i don't know why i'm identifying with the peasant class but anyway i'm sorry but i'm kind of losing track of your point i mean not to, not oh, okay. to be by the way we had a monarchy stream just the other day yes the and in fact so, in that in that monarchy <laughs> stream something uh, interesting was brought up that i hadn't considered before and eventually during our discussion i would love for this to be talked about which is one very important thing for me as someone who comes from the ussr is that there should be checks and balances to power and from the conversation we've had a lot of people seem to agree that back during the uh, good old medieval days there was checks and balances to power where we would have the king but then you would also have the nobility that would act as checks to the king and uh, the uh, peasantry would also act as checks to whatever nobles were there because there were more of them than, than there were of him but I don't know like this is something that I can't really say is the case because I don't have a time machine I can't go back in well, time well, and see what it's well, like I can't tell you I live in a monarchy by the way it's called Sweden so and, and but and, let's let's <laughs> Let's, try to, no, but let's get to the point because because I'm, I'm I'm really losing the point that Joel's making and, and yeah I, I'll, I'll get to, I'll get to the make. point I'll hit the accelerator pedal so my, my my point is is that within liberalism obviously the fundamental point of what liberalism is supposed to be doing is delivering us freedom right but then near reaction comes along and says well hey wait a second like if we actually want freedom and we're going to be libertarian we're going to want freedom more than anybody else within liberalism we actually have to start critiquing liberalism to actually get it. And th to me, this is like a very deeply Hegelian kind of move. The, the initial, the initial point that we're trying to make is that what is the role that physical space time has in in relation to history? That's the the initial the initial point. But if if I, I'm sorry for cutting you off, but it's well, my like point my point was that if you look at Plato, if you look at Kant, obviously very serious guys, right in history. The reason why they're projecting these uh, detemporalized uh, you know, one of the fundamental reasons why they're projecting these detemporalized um, metaphysics, uh, where you try and trick this like space outside of time and history with which to legislate history from, if you, under if you try to understand what they're doing historically, they're responding to specific moral and social problematics. And I'm saying, okay, we have, a, that, that, that's an interesting 
thing to notice. I, Joel, they, Joel is brilliant here. So the point is, and I think Joel agrees with me, the big break in Western thinking is between Kant and Hegel. And, and I'm one of these guys who work with, I'm Hegelian, but I'm also Deleuze. And I definitely think Deleuze completely misunderstood Hegel. He's much closer to Hegel than he thought. Hegel introduces process as primary in Western thinking. Without Hegel, there's no Whitehead, but there's no Nietzsche, there's no Freud, there's no Jung. And the forms that Kant and Plato like autistically try to shape mathematically return with Freud and Jung through the archetypes. So the archetypes that I work with are formed over long periods of time. They're not ideals, they're just formed. It's basically, you've got a tribal structure, you've got a thousand people, you've got to survive together, you've got to meet other tribes and kill them before they kill you. You've got to find food to eat, you've got to reproduce. This kind of tribe works in a no biological setting, like Deleuze said. They work with it like an re internal return of the same as the history of themselves. And to make that work over long periods of time, eventually certain archetypes develop and are reinforced through evolution. And the reason why the forms return with Jung and these other guys and why, why we're so interested in anthropology today is because with anthropology, we're finally getting the forms right because the forms are now tied to the time axis. So we're staying now with Hegel. And I think we can't get beyond that. I, I, any, any decent thing. Okay, well, if I may yeah. jump off. Yeah. No, you go, you go, John. Then I have a long. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, uh, like, I want to address what, 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 what Joel's saying. Cause like, I'm trying to. I think an issue I have with what you're saying, Joel, is like, there's a couple things. The first is, if we're talking about an end of history, uh, you know, history as something that you um, come to understand, a major component of that is the, uh, the unfolding of history and not only that, the way in which it's like understood as something leading towards and unfolding into something. So that's that's the idea of 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 of, of teleology, which like uh, Aristotle places into uh, his principles, right? And so, uh, and and then I'll, I'll put that point aside. But um, like Aristotle, for example, he's defining the limitations of understanding and defining the beginning of rationality. And um, now, yes, of, I think that the, uh, I th maybe this, I'm, I'm adding something to what you were saying that wasn't there, but when you're saying like, um, our, the understanding of history in the, the West, or we have these bureaucracies that try to project themselves beyond time, and it's almost like a, a hubris, like it's a argument that we're being hubristic, uh, like, like we have so much hubris to think that we can know things uh, without the way in which time plays a role in, into uh, our understanding of things and, and the way in which we can control things. I think that um, the point that maybe you're missing is that I do think that there can be an end point in, of history and there can be events that take place physically in time in which they never happened before and they would ask for something to be understood and learn from them, would, but would be beyond the limitation of human understanding to be understood. And if we're talking about the Christian tradition, this is the whole point of the resurrection and like Christ and everything is that this is beyond the ability for human understanding and that's like why you have the liturgy. And this is actually like I was reading Aquinas the other day. Like that's the point that Aquinas makes is that there's is like is there um uh why do we need uh God and why would we need um litur like the liturgy if if we don't uh if we can just understand uh how to like, uh, and I'm, I'm putting words in his mouth, like how we can just understand how to live correctly if we follow dialectical rationality. And the point is because the things that take place um, in the Christian worldview are actually beyond the capacity of rational understanding and require God to give you the word to like understand it. And I think this is the point of end of history is that the end of history, it would be ex very similar, but maybe in a secular sense, it would be but, and, and less uh, optimistic. It's like we are coming to a point 
in the development of human understanding and consciousness and the things that can take place before a human being in which the way in which we've understood the limitation of rationality uh, can no longer recuperate and collect towards an understanding. So like, and can, the, I, can I just interrupt and yeah. ask you, why is it only Americans to talk about the end of history? It's not the only Americans. Uh, yes, it is. Because we are the end of history, man. <laughs> okay, it's at the end of the American. Oh, it's no longer the divine logos. I'm just asking. It's, something... it's not. The, asking. It's not only Americans. It, it all comes from Germans. <laughs> no, I mean, really, it literally does. No, but, okay, but it's okay. no longer okay. the divine. Your, is this point finished? Because I'd like to say yeah. some stuff back. Because I was trying to pay attention and think about what I'm going to say. But so. but so so I think that um, <laughs> in terms of Plato and becoming, um, and actually I wanted to bring this up earlier, but you know if you. Uh, in Aristotle's metaphysics, the metaphysics starts with his, like a history of philosophy. And it tries to come to an account of basically why Plato is doing what he's doing and what sort of conclusions. And this is a very like, how do I put it? Colloquial history. This is not some sort of um, like serious history, but I, the, the point sort of is that everyone understood in Greece that there were atoms and that it was undeniable, right, that there was a, that everything to, in a certain way was completely changing. The things you read from the fragments of Heraclitus, this was generally accepted, but people had a sense that there must be something beyond like uh, the these lowest forms of reality that allow us to understand that things are happening and that we can go about like exi like existing in a way in which comprehends because like they didn't the really have rationality yet. so you have like this development of the forms that's uh comes into its development and it's uh, like beginning through uh their the interaction of the pythagoreans uh it's and, way uh, older than that it's way older than that. sorry but you can't start with the greeks and be serious no you but no it's not older than that because it because, is way can i can older i, can I make that. this point let me let heraclitus me wasn't even no, greek. See, heraclitus was a persian to begin with i mean just wait what did you say yeah Heraclitus was Median. He was a Median court philosopher. Was it, the reason why you only find fragments of Heraclitus in, in ancient Greece is because he wasn't Greek. Well, he, 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 he way would, older. Median, way older. Would you say Median is close to Greek? Like, what are Medeans? Uh, no, the Median is the Western Persian Empire that's prior mm. to the Eastern Persian Empire that comes way earlier than the Greeks. It doesn't, it, this, this is not important to my, really, it's not important to my point. The, the sense is, and you can see this in Lucretius and the Southern Italian uh, philosophers yeah. please there, get to it, the point yes and then i can we can go back okay. to what i tried to make a parenthesis of okay but uh you know it, it's it's that the, the the forms come the forms come out of uh this attempt to well it's i think it's successful in in trying to explain why human understanding and uh not just human understanding but knowledge can still exist even though the there is an undeniable like almost truth that the world is completely changing and takes and much of what we observe yeah. directly and what maybe Hegel will call an immediacy is completely becoming, you know, and yeah. Hegel writes. Okay. In, Wait, now, Alexander, okay. before we get before we get to yes. your reply, Joel was the uh, first in line waiting to reply. So, Joel, now is your chance. Go for it. And then we're going to get to Alex. Yeah. So the point that I'm trying to make here is. First of all, the idea that there's an end of history, I think is ridiculous. So I'm attacking that, but not only am I attacking that, I'm trying to show how the very notion that you could think that history could end itself has a history. And I'm trying to describe what that history is, um, as a way to like double, like, you know, just throw the right hand after I jab kind of thing. So the point that I'm trying to make is that projecting, uh, you know, projecting these forms or projecting any kind of metaphysics outside of time itself has a history and we can talk about that history uh and the, the it's it's relation to that history is as you said okay we need to have some way of okay this there's, there's this constant flux this constant becoming we need to be able to intelligibly talk about the world still and have some kind of idea of what's going on and agree upon that 
Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to deny uh, temporality. But one, one way of doing this is to deny temporality and say, well, there is this atemporal uh, metaphysical realm of being, which is pure forms, which we can appeal to, that can legislate for us in, in all cases, no matter what happens. Um, that, like that is that, like, negate, that, that's that's like the negate the human uncertainty between um, different contents, like the is ought paradox. Like that's what Kant was responding to mm. is that fundamental human uncertainty between like uh, the self being a bundle of sticks and history and so forth. That's what the sort of the ground of that Kant was operating under is what you're saying, Joel. Well, let's go to yeah, Alexander. But, but I think but, uh, let me finish this point sure. just quickly. Yeah. But I think there's another way of approaching this rather than having this kind of skeptical view. Okay, well, everything is, is constantly in flux. Everything's changing. And so we have no certainty whatsoever. That, that, we don't need to take that position either. We could say, okay, well, ideas themselves have a history. And so we, if we understand them as having a history, if I understand myself as an individual, I have a history. I can't understand my personality based upon my thoughts right now. I have to think about my entire life that's where I get my character, personality, my traits, my understanding of who I am from. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not, to be, not to be dismissive, but I really don't see how you're addressing my point. Well, I, I, maybe I don't, I, maybe I misunderstood your point. You know, my, 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 the, the point in which I made about like the, where, where I brought up Aquinas, where I'm saying that yet the end of history is not necessarily an end of human events in which give us something that should be learned from. And I use the example from, Christian, the Christian religion, where the the uh, Christians and Aquinas says that there is in the events of the the Christian religion that have to take place in from the Old Testament to the New Testament, those events that make up the Bible are beyond human understanding. You can see the concept of the end of history in a similar sense, in which we come to maybe a threshold of human events in which the limited capacity of human rationality Al can we got to go to alexander it's been too long yeah we're back there well, then can i go on my spiel that's just repetition that? yeah and then alexander then logo then geo alexander go okay. for it okay so if you think of only you can't think outside of time you can't describe anything outside of time whenever somebody says is rather than uh, you know pro talks about being they talk about being a long time anyway time is where you got to start and my point is that if you talk to the Persians and you check it with the Persians 4,000 years ago, before the Greeks started thinking, with the Persian thinking came the idea that uh, everything is process, meaning it's not metallurgical, it returns to the same all the time. We all know that. That lasted for hundreds of thousands of years. But suddenly an idea comes along, the only real idea except them for Hegel's negation. And that's the idea 3,700 years ago from Zoroaster, which starts Zoroasternism and, and then starts Persian thinking in the Persian Empire. Uh, is the idea that on top of the process where everything changes all the time, it returns to the same, comes the possibility of the event. And this is the direct result of the fact that we permanently settled. And once you permanently settle, we get obsessed with forms of all kinds because we do architecture, we do irrigation, we do all these things. And that shapes our thinking. So in top of the process, we get the event, the idea of the event. This is where Christianity gets it from. So before you go to Kinos and Christianity, you cannot even have Christianity. You cannot have Judaism or anything. I'm, I'm not a Christian, by the way. Just okay. That. But so, so the, the idea of the event actually is tied to process. And then you get a, a worldview where you have process, you have event. And the event is the idea that something can actually happen that radically changes everything forever. So the end of history is basically leading up to the event. Once the event has happened, a new history takes over. This is exactly what we do in physics. Now when you do emergence vector theory, when you do transcendental emergentism. So you go from say subphysics to physics, to chemistry, to biology, to mind, to culture. And you discuss these different emergence vectors as separate vectors with their own rules and things. You talk about implicate and explicate orders to try to understand how they relate to one another. You get a completely flat universe. It's relationalist. It has no priorities whatsoever. You can get rid of the created God once and for all. And you can do that precisely by not prioritizing either consciousness or physics or anything in between. Now you can do that. If you do that with, with all of natural of the natural world out there, you basically just realize that we live within one of those events ourselves. It's called mind and we produce culture because of it. And between mind and culture, we then have paradigms in history that we do the same thing with. And then you can start tracing what kind of topology, what kind of landscape would make people think that forms are necessary or forms are a great idea. And then you can understand where the Greeks come from, where the Egyptians prior to that come from and the Persians came from and why they thought the way they did. 
I think that's may a much make more one point. Way. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. Like the. You, the, the way that I feel like you're making a lot of your points, and I really apologize to characterize them in general, mm -hmm. is that they begin from like this anthropological point. And I'm not, which, uh, and, and I actually very much accept that, but the, like people like Hegel and Aristotle and, uh, you know, Kant, they, their point is literally being made, the beginning of their point is literally being made from like the syllogism. What way are Hegel and Kant similar here? Because Hegel is very different from Kant in that department. Well, they're not different, I don't think, in this department. In which, like, for example, in the science of logic, like, it, it's he's using logic in the way that, like, for example, um, in Aristotle's logic, like, this is where you get all of these points. Like, you get dialectics from Hegel's logic. You get prior and you get posterior from Hegel's logic. You get all these points from Hegel's logic and Hegel's using logic, philosophical logic, sort of, as uh, this uh, uh, idea that logic can be used to uh, expose the, 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 uh, the science of knowledge. Basically, or the 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 the, the well, uh, he's, he uses the word logic very differently from Kant. So to begin with, it's just like when you read Hegel and he's finished it difficult because he uses the words very differently from anybody else. It's a bit like Whitehead, okay? So I would say when he uses logic, he actually means that there's a verstand, which is what we usually call logos, and there's a vernunft, which is the mythos. So it, it's just like your brain house with Hegel. It's just like there's pathos and there's logos. Machine can only do logos. We can do pathos. Probably that's how we divide ourselves eventually. But you do log in the only way for the pathos and the logos to unify around is by telling a story, which is a mythical story. This is how Hegel actually does abstraction and then he does uh, and goes towards the concretion through the negation. So the, the, that's how he understands how you can move from Verstand to Vernunft all the time. And he actually, when he talks about Vernunft, it's way more mythos than it's actually logos in the traditional sense. That's what's weird about Hegel and his vocabulary. So that's why I would argue he's very different here from Kant, but he loves Aristotle. So he, he, he is Aristotle to Plato the way he, you know, the relationship Hegel Kant is a bit similar to the one between Aristotle and Plato. I agree, but no, I mean, I guess, and I'm more on the Aristotle side, but um, the, 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 the point that I'm trying to make is that I think, um, the, the the there is a way in which we can define and it's actually completely wrong to say define but hegel attempts to through uh like gnostic gnostic uh like and i'm using gnostic in the neoplatonistic term like the through the highest level of reality uh, is, and through prior logic is trying to and it's not exactly prior logic but through a prior logic is trying to develop an understanding of history and this form of history in which is understood through a prior like uh, like a very uh like non-hypothetical understanding of history uh this form of history i do think it actually would necessarily as an unfolding come to a point of culmination in the relationship with the development of consciousness so the point in which consciousness oh, no okay. longer develops. Okay, I get, I get yeah. it. Can, can I just yeah. break in? He's not a determinist. You have to point, we, we're actually developing trans determinism now with my team because actually understanding Hegel as a determinist is making it wrong. What he says is essentially that all of his trap until now would probably then uh, say is necessary. So necessity is something we apply in history. It really is. It can only be understood as necessary up till now. But because of probability, it's not really determinism versus indeterminism. Two unfortunate terms, by the way. They're both wrong. Things well, can listen, locally listen, be either. What are you talking about? But determinism. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, well, okay. Listen, we got, these we got, are not. But these are hypothetical points. These are points of intermediate being. These are not part of prior logic. Like no, what you're so talking Hegel's about. So Hegel's future is contingent. Hegel's future is radically contingent. That's why it's usually most misunderstood. So that we, we that's it's contingent. Good. Yeah, it's massive and contingent. That's what it is. And this is what Deleuze, for example, misunderstood with Hegel, which I find brilliant. And I, I can't see anybody. He was tired of Spinoza's boring universe and he loved Spinoza. And the break with Spinoza is least as important as the break with Kant and Hegel. He, he's, he goes to he's Schelling, he fights Schelling as being too Spinozist. He's tired of the dead world that Spinoza creates, a kind of meaningless flat world. And for Hegel, that's just, that's just fun enough to do. And actually he does 
a rebel. He really goes post bonus and he manages to do that. Although few people understand that's actually what he changed. I want to hear, I wanna hear from Logo. Hegel? Oh, go, go for it, Gio. You yeah. were hiding your power well, level. Like, I was just going to ask, how do you reconcile Hegel with Deleuze then? Because Deleuze really is um, a Spinozian. And what you're describing sounds like the plane of imminence, uh, at least in what you're saying about the development of history and consciousness and so forth. So how would you square the circle? Then I have okay, my Okay, great field, question, right? dude. Great question. That I is feel like I feel like we're just jerking each other off here. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, but I love you. I love you. I don't know. Okay. I want to cool it's, it down. Okay. Deleuze did all this great work in the 1960s. Whatever he did in terms of pop philosophy, getting laid and all that, mm. with Watari later, is pop stuff. He was amazing in the 60s. He wrote three books. First was Nietzsche philosophy. You should read that parallel with Heidegger. Heidegger's end of his life was writing about Nietzsche worshiping him, yeah. sucking Nietzsche's dick, right? And Deleuze starts with Nietzsche. And reading those two parallels is a fantastic read. Then comes Difference and Repetition. That was 1967. That was his PhD. Deleuze's Difference and Repetition is incredibly Nietzsche, but he then understands the eternal recurrence of the same as there's a difference in each loop and that difference makes all the difference in the world. That's the difference of the repetition. What, what Deleuze doesn't understand is that that is Hegelian dialectics. <laughs> That's what it is. Hegel and yeah. Nietzsche are much closer than people realize. Nietzsche came out of Hegel and, and they're much closer. They think much closer than they think. It's just different vocabularies and things, but they actually do. And, and you read difference and repetition at if it's a Hegelian text rather than a Spinoza's text. It actually makes more sense. That's what we try to force onto the Lusians now. And Nick Lund and other Lusians agree with me that this is why we have to reread history. Because then difference, not certain of difference, then yeah. difference would sort of be um, that almost Hegelian in the sense of repetition culminates and eventually difference culminates from repetition or from that like crucial tension between those two, we would say. I would say what Deleuze doesn't get that we get in our work is that difference is actually an idea that difference was just let's go out and hunt or let's go out and fight warfare and then come back to the same repetition all over again. Medici Aliad is adamant, for example, in the world of anthropology that everything was repeated. That's return. right, yes, Aliad. Yeah, the yeah. break starts with Zoroaster and, and they're close to it, but he doesn't get it. So Deleuze doesn't get all, he starts with the Greeks like everybody else makes that mistake. He loves Heraclitus like everybody else, but he doesn't understand if you go further down in history, you actually discover there were cultures that thought everything was becoming and didn't even consider being like Persian culture did. And then when you see that, you say, oh my God, if you look at Zoroaster, what he actually achieved 3,700 years ago was that he was the first guy to prioritize dif difference over repetition. And he said, we no longer have to be nomadological and repetitive in everything we do. We can actually go masculine and phallic and think the event. And the fact that a difference occurs, it can go in either way, it can be trauma or it can be event. But if we can try to direct it towards the event, you know, do good in life, then actually we can create a better world. The name of that project is technology. I want to call technology. on- Yeah, and this is the point that I wanted to go- Yeah. To. Well, yeah, first, yeah, go ahead. Gio, before you go, I want to call on Logo. And also there is a comment from Elton John Candy. I love that name. Please subscribe. I wonder how many jewel pods Logo has went through in his silence uh, so far. So Logo- About like, half one. One pull, one pull. He can do it. <laughs> About half. Yeah. Um, I feel like uh, things are just kind of getting uh, sidetracked here. It's kind of uh, getting a little boring because I thought we were talking about the end of history here and no one's really decided like who defined that term or what it means. And now I guess we're getting close to the point where we can finally talk about this because we're talking about Hegel and Deleuze, right? Well, who's like the figure right in between Hegel and Deleuze? Who, who does Deleuze even read Hegel through? And Hippolyte via? or Hippoly, right? Uh, it's Kajev. Kajev, Kajev, yes. Kajev, Specifically yes. Kajev. And Kajev is the important person, I think, when it comes to defining the end of history. I think he's the only one who's done it adequately. And that's the only real interpretation I think is like worth talking about. Because we can talk about these other abstract ideas of what an end of history is. Blah, Why blah, don't blah. you summarize? Why don't you summarize? Kajev's okay, absolutely. So Kajev's, oh, Kajev's yes. understanding of the end of history is in Final. regards very specifically to juridical phenomenon in the West, in particular law. So the question of history is that of the relationship of the classes in social relations. It's that of production, which I feel like Bard was sort of getting to when you start talking about like, you know, like, oh, okay, so we have like the eternal return when we start living like, you know, less nomadic lives and these sorts of other things, right? Like these are all of these ideas are tied to the societies in which they're created. So it's a, a implicitly like the social relations specifically in a class structured society, right? So in the West, what we have is the move from the eternal world of the master society in which there is a master class and a slave class. This is the norm for the majority of human history to 
one in which those roles start to merge into themselves, right? And that's what the dialectic is ultimately in history is between the masters and slaves in legal terms becoming identical in the concept of the citizen, which is where we are now. So we don't have really, we have like the leftover remnants of like master societies and slave societies. There's still slavery, et cetera, but there is still the concept of the citizen has expanded and is continuing to expand. And juridically and legally, we have not seen it very much uh, change or go backwards, you might say, towards one that uh, describes like two different classes of people in which a master follows a certain set of laws and a slave follows a different set of laws or that they have different um, abilities to represent themselves juridically. But the only case we have in which that's true today is, be is through capital, right? So the question of the end of history is like we're at the position where the way Kajev sees it is that the idea of the end of history is just the concept of the citizen in legal terms be expanding. So the idea ultimately would be the universal homogenous state in which people are all citizens of the world, right? And that would mean that they're legally protected. So when you talk about something like the UN and it's like, well, where did, where does the UN talk about this idea? Like, where did human rights come from? Well, it's hard to like, you know, they're, they're not going to say it comes from God anymore, obviously. Right. What they would say is they would come from history. And what they mean by history is ultimately precedents and like juridical changes over centuries. The bricklage of history, in other words, being the, yeah. Well, it's mostly like, it's mostly like in really small ways, right? Because it's like, you look at, the, say, like the development of the Anglo legal system, which is like extremely important, or like the Napoleonic code, which is what Kajev specifically talks about. These things are all coming from like cases and precedents and the idea of like the, of justice developing um, for a very long time. I mean, like the common law tradition in England, for instance, is like one of the oh, most it's important Judaism. parts of it. Oh, Judaism is not. Yeah, that too. That too, of course. Yeah. Well, well, the, the, Anglo the, code, in other uh, words. the Napoleonic yeah. Code is almost the basis for like almost all legal systems in that uh, after... Like Japan basically uses the Napoleonic yes. code. Like all I mean, this is so. This is what Kajev says when he says it's the end of history, right? He's saying like, okay, you have all these communist revolutions. What is it really? And what he means by really is like legally in the long term is what it is is the Napoleonic code coming to Russia or the Napoleonic code coming to China, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, that, yeah, that, but... that's the correct reading of Kajev's understanding of Hegel. Of course, is the vulgar reading of Hegel. This is like Hegel as the founder of the. You could say that, but but it's yeah, the yeah. Marxist. It's like the post. -Marxist. Hegel is way more than that. Yeah, it's very yeah, Marxist. I know. I can understand the vulgar. You seem, there, yeah. I, you yeah. seem very much attracted to what uh, like what Lukash would call like a rationalism. That seems to be where you're going. Like you, you're very much more in favor of like the mythic idea of time in history than you are, say, like a very kind of vulgar, as you say, materialist understanding of just like class. I'm an emergentist, let's put it that way. So yeah, that's yes, like kind of like you're, you're praying ultimately. To... Mm. Wait, Gio, what, what was your point? Because uh, we were- Well, no, well, I think the, the point being is that the, the problem, and this comes up with Kojev's conversations with Leo Strauss, is that ultimately he's talking about a material recognition of all peoples in the universal histor a historical um, universal homogenous state. So eventually all citizens, citizens of the world, the whole, uh, you know, I'm a citizen of the world idea. Eventually that constitutes what, you know, Hegel called recognition where it's, it goes beyond even just like quote unquote, like Anglo Talmudic right frameworks. It's more of just uh, that sort of that one totality of an expression that everyone in the world is being quote unquote recognized by this like mm. and by the legal system yeah. specifically exactly or yeah. also what about like the material like the affirmation so for example in certain sjw comics affirmation of someone's identity would be a very no, important but this thing. is what i wanted to jump off of this is what particularly um mr bard here writes in in uh digital diabolic about before i get to that i wanted to talk about to jump off what uh what what joel was saying about uh this line between Hegel, Kant, Bergson, the problem really always goes back to something that's perennial and something that's fundamental within all philosophy and with all, uh, with all issues of what is history itself, which is being and becoming. We know this. So on the one hand, you know, the Heideggerian in me, when we were talking, comes out and says that, you know, history... And, and I'm, I, I side more with the mythic 
view of history that it is a revealing and concealment. It is uh, it is being revealing itself, and I would say through things like um, religion, philosophy, but in particular the work of art, in every single epoch is cemented this uniting of the content of history itself with the world of a particular era. And so Heidegger talks about this in, you know, being in the work of art. So really what we forgot with accentuating space and the conquest of space and instrumental reason, all of the sort of enlightenment project that it forgot becoming, it forgot temporality and it forgot the flux of time. And so people like to an extent Nietzsche Heidegger, maybe Deleuze, uh, they want to get back to this fundamental reality of becoming and of temporality. And I think this is where the conversation gets grounded. So the thing with the end of history is that when we talk about our own episteme, and again, that's very, you know, Foucauldian language, we talk about the, the digital sort of giving us in some ways, and in some ways I think this maybe comes out in Alexander Bard's writing, the digital reality of, of uh, globalization and, tele- and techno capital and telecommunications for the first time, w- apart from the use of myth and the work of art, now we fully get to see um, that recognition in real time. And we're sort of, but there's a lot of downsides to it because now we're talking about the whole platform of the world fully recognizing itself through not just memory, but you know the memory of, of being able to record ourselves and being able to play it back and so forth, but also the fact that we uh, that there's a temptation to broadcast and to uh, project ourselves for this sort of thirst for recognition uh, that ultimately will play into the hands of what Deleuze would call the societies of control because now the subject is not this sort of mythic uh, entity. Rather, it's a set of information and an input and output mechanism that then the societies control and gather and collect and so forth. And so a lot of what we're talking about has always sort of been present throughout history. So this whole notion of, it's very similar to what Horkheimer and Adorno said about, um, about the nature of like myth versus instrumental reason. Instrumental reason was always there. Same with the societies of control or humanity becoming uh, a, a data set. It was always there. Yeah, that's the that's history. where the term arithmetic comes from. Is the medieval basically control theory? Exactly. Yeah. But the, but the reason I wanted to bring this is because it almost seems that, and you know, Logo he he talks about this as well. Uh, while he tweets about this, we're still subject to this fundamental process of a um, coming into uh, an end of history of sorts. By end, we mean this proliferation of hyper modernity through various different meta narratives and various micro narratives that we're sort of uh, inculcating in the present. So for example, if you believe that, uh, you know, it was all Iranian civilization or it was all the Greeks or it was all the Scythians, it's like, it seems we're building this uh, bricklage of historicities that grade against each other that are in these little micro bubbles and we're extending these various narratives out towards the totality of human history. But we can only do this because we have access to uh, various aspects of digital modernity that is informing our subjectivity. Our sense of self has been exploded to the point where we need to recapitulate some sort of uh, wholeness or integration or grounding of being itself with various like narratives that are contradictory and perspectival. And this is what you know, Nietzsche and Deleuze and so forth and and Heidegger is talking about because it seems that even this chat right now, what we're doing is a product of that because we all have our different perspectives on the grounding of history itself, but it still comes back to that, uh, that sort of indeterminacy that we're experiencing right now in our own episteme, in our own epoch. So I don't know if that makes fucking sense because I'm just like, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Joel, sorry. If I could jump in, the reason why I took the, the trajectory that I took what I, in my previous remarks, bringing up Moldbug, which seems ridiculous because he doesn't deserve to be kind of ranked with these other thinkers. Isn't, <laughs> is, is, he, I think he does this by accident, not on purpose. But what, what he does is, I think, identify a, a contradiction um, within the dialectical structure of liberalism that we can then affirm. And then I think like a post-neo-reactionary view can ultimately 
is, is my argument for why little... history, but why history has not ended in the way that uh, Logo describes. It's okay, we have this jurisprudential paradigm. I kind of want to push against you a little on this one because well, I, well, I know. Let, let Curtis, me explain. Yeah, let, let me explain I myself. Where, I know where you're going. No, I, hold I on. Let, let Joe going. explain. Uh, you think you don't know, so let Joe explain. Right. Then you're gonna yeah, go for let, it. Let me explain. So if, if you want to look at the jurisprudential paradigm itself, historically, you go back to pre-modern period, you have, you know, you know, if, if you were, you know, if you're living in the 11th century, for example, the idea that the state would have some kind of um, legal system that would regulate all disputes in society wasn't an idea that, that was really like that, that we had. I mean, ultimately, the church was fundamentally responsible for the majority of legal practice and they, a lot of the, the initial innovations in the creation of things like human rights and a lot of the legal paradigms that we have came out of the church itself. But then you have this kind of war, uh, that kind of this kind of European civil war of sorts institutionally that, that, that kind of occurs between the papacy and the northern aristocracies. And so one of the functions that is necessary for the northern aristocracies to perform to take authority away from the papacy and liberate themselves from papal control is to establish their own legal systems and so this is particularly played out in britain obviously uh britain ha you know with, has a very rich legal tradition um what the british do ultimately is create a a a kind of secularized legal system that is then responsible to the king rather than to the papacy um and this is essentially the basis of technocracy in a certain sense, because what they, they do is say, okay, well, if you look at um, like Francis Bacon, for example, the dude was the attorney general of the UK and he explicitly says, okay, what empiricism is essentially is me taking legal principles of inquiring into jurisprudence and then, and then projecting them onto epistemology. And, you know, you have like the Royal College and all these different institutions subject to the King where all the, the, you know, the scientific disciplines are established. Ultimately, this is the basis for where, you know, liberal political theory is established as a second. And like, and like you said, itself. with Kant, with like the way he even describes uh, the human itself through the faculties of the understanding, it's all, it's very legalistic. It's very almost like instrumental reason. It's, it's got like this uh, almost corporate structure where the content of the under is get fed into the understanding of the categories and, Sure. And it's very legalistic and yeah. but this idea of putting the state at the center of our jurisp uh, jurisprudential paradigm is something that gets derived out of this war between the northern aristocracies and the papacy because god was supposed to be the I mean, you still swear on the bible today in most legal systems when you have to give an affidavit or something or uh, you know bear witness in a court for this reason because the courts are supposed to be fundamentally theological, at least historically, but this has been secularized to assert authority yes. to the state. And the and lowering of a since the Protestant Reformation. and ult Ultimately yeah. to the technocracy. And so the, yes. what, what we live in, right, you say, okay, well, we have this universalist jurisprudential paradigm. Everyone has recognized their rights, all recognized in universality. But there is ultimately a new master-slave dialectic that has emerged, which is ultimately there's the technocracy and then there's everybody else. And we're actually yes. being mm. subjugated by this bureaucratic technocracy that has usurped the control that the church previously had um, as a dogmatic institution running the West. Um, but then they sell it to you as, oh, this is science, this is rationality, this is, this is you know, we, we're actually oh, just kind it, of, it, just, we're just doing epistemology here. We're not, we're, we're not, we're not dogmatic theologians. Even, 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 even that's over, Joel. We're going through the same paradigm shift all over again. We're leaving academia, we're leaving politics, we're leaving mass media, we're leaving all the industry precisely for that reason. We're doing exactly the same things we did in the summer times. Right now we're digital. We're going to have a new class society, more brutal than ever. And it's going to have three different autocracies that rule it. And here's the interesting thing. They're going to be voyeuristic and step aside because they're so sick and tired of being exposed all the time because we live in the era of hyper narcissism and everybody has a camera and a microphone. Meaning for the first time ever, power will disappear from you. I think that's fundamental to what's going on right now. Well, I don't know. I don't you know. call it the decorationist that's, that's society. That's a, yeah, decor decorationism is, 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 is the end of the old paradigm. The, when we go, the, you know, the, you stand in Versailles and you go, you obsessed with tonality and etiquette and it's called the woke culture and shit like that these days. And none of that is even important any longer. Oh. It's just completely symbolic. Well, we were so talking about, I think it's very similar to we the society. We're talking about a sensocracy yeah. coming. We're talking about a global police state, whether we mm. like it or not, it's gonna happen. It's everywhere now. And then the question is philosophically, what I'm working with is the response to the Chinese dream of Xi Jinping 
playing in a dictator is that, oh, I'm not going to be moral about this, but actually a dictatorship doesn't last very long and it's not a very good way to keep creativity going within a system. It turns out that systems actually that are more plural seem to work better. And how can we figure that out? Oh, we need yeah, power. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't buy that. We need to split power. Yes, we need That's to split kind of power. Sauce. Logo, what do you think? Yeah, no. Yeah. No, okay. wait, I think Joel sorry, had, was going first and then. Yeah, my, my computer crashed for a sec, but I'm back. Um, this kind of, I guess if we're talking about tyranny and stuff too, we can kind of talk about e NRX and- He didn't rage and quit. Together. Yeah. And you also <laughs> but, had a um, response to Joel before that. Yeah, no, this all ties together. So I don't like, I know Curtis pretty well. And um, uh, I, I think that he's not really saying anything new. He's really, um, he's talking no, about a lot of- like he's basically interested in like enlightenment absolutism, not even particularly um, like older forms of monarchy, but particularly the like enlightenment absolutist monarch, um, which isn't even that's like pretty like it's a modern innovation. And you could say it's like liberal on its own anyway. Well, it's, and, a, it's uh, a liberalization of primordial it's a liberalization monarchy that was of, present yeah, yeah. in Christendom and absolutely. even before Christendom. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So like what it really is, so if you're saying like it's a form of liberalism, you could say that absolutist monarchy is like a sort of uh, version of like neoliberalism even. And uh, like, what are the what are the places that he points to, right? Where he's like, oh, like these are the people doing it well. It's like Singapore, right? It's like a lot of these like East Asian um, monarchies or like, you know- Oriental Luxembourg. strongman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And that's not really like that. that that's not really, that doesn't really go against the end of history in any real way. It's, it's just another form of um, like, bureaucracy really like this is sort of this is this is like you know this is like what was salazar in portugal during the 20th century was essentially like an enlightened monarch like he was like an enlightened despot and like but salazar was based and he was had authority from the catholic I, no Church. i that I, was I, the difference I, well yeah sorry, I, sorry sorry i like salazar i like salazar but you know he's the fundamentally or like you know he's kind of like <laughs> yemen de valera he's like yemen de valera in ireland well, at the yeah. same time or like fdr like we had a lot of these like people that you know you could consider dictators but you guys are absolutist. bored with the united states of america as it is <laughs> you're so sick and bored no, but i think there is a temptation anything else exercise. will go right well, there, there well is, it's it's more it's not no i, I think uh Moldbug's more uh, he's not really interested in like america as it is he's more interested in uh like having a monarchy somewhere just like a place just like he, he wants like a startup nation like an island society as like a that would be run like a startup basically <laughs> okay That's okay where... okay i'll give you an example guys oh, wait, okay. joel let, let joel go and then can, can, let, let me respond okay to this yes. quickly. okay so the reason why i bring up Moldbug is is not just the idea of monarchy obviously that's nothing new obviously just reading all these old books about you know absolutist uh, or like just counter enlightenment thinkers or whatever that's not nothing new obviously what's new is him taking his cues from his libertarianism and saying i no, guess that's what maybe, popper maybe, did yeah hopper did i was about just about to say that you mm -hmm. can say that he's already heading in that direction but it doesn't really matter who which name i'm just using a name because uh, to draw an example we are trying to be in, in the pursuit of trying to be the best liberals that we can. We end up getting jettisoned outside of liberalism. That's yeah, it's that's neoliberalism, baby. Well, I don't know if <laughs> that, 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 that you could really say that because neoliberalism is, I mean, as far as I understand the concept, is ultimately just you know a, a paradigm under which you know basically we extend human rights to this kind of universalized you know international With institutions and have a bunch projecting. of yeah have yeah. yeah and and I don't I don't like Moldbug's positive like neo cameralism is ridiculous and I don't I don't really like much of his po positive philosophy and I'm not trying to say Moldbug is the future or the answer just that there's an event that yeah, occurs yeah, yeah. No, I get what you're in, with, with with neo reaction in which now okay there's something more to say the, the problem now how do we actually respond to because obviously the other aspect of Moldbug's thinking and ultimately neo reactionary thinking is taking in all of the um, Italian elitists. And obviously this isn't new, the paleocons were aware of this stuff and so forth. But yeah, the neoliberals. Yeah, but the 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 point that kind of derives yeah. out of this is, okay, well, we're living under a technocracy and we're aware of this. 20th century became aware of this quite explicitly. The PMC classes, yeah. How do we actually affirm, if, if, if affirming freedom and justice and so forth within liberalism ultimately just feeds the technocracy. How do we actually affirm any of these things authentically in a way that we can actually get some of them as opposed to 
being told we're getting them, but getting the opposite, which is what, which is basically well, what the question doing. is, what would, what is, like, what is freedom? Like, I, I, this has like always bothered me. Like everyone's like, well, like how, I, what are you, what's like impinging on your freedom? Mm. What it actually yeah, is. It's, a, it's, it's ultimately a negative concept. So if you tried to make it positive and say, well, actually, uh, I care about something like creativity. I care about people What's taking stopping response. you from being creative. But freedom is also freedom. Well, no, it's not about stopping. A... It's about it's about allowing. We have a society in which you're not allowed to take responsibility for things in so many cases because you have this giant bureaucracy that wants to regulate it. So, um, you know, if, if I could give like an example, a um, family member of mine was in the Air Force. He was a firefighter in the Air Force. And, uh, you know, they recently in Australia got all cucked and decided we need to have 50% of the armed services being female for some fucking reason. Same in Canada uh, with the, yeah. Fucking, well, it's insane, right? Day of the rake. So, <laughs> day of the rake. Obviously they can't do many of these combat roles because they're women. And so they just kind of push them into all these like non-combat aspects of the air force, including firefighters. So he's been doing this for years. So, you know, he was free from the purge, I guess. But all the people that are coming in are all women, right? And his sergeant was saying, oh, these people are these, you know, they're, they're nice girls or whatever, but they literally are failing all of the entry requirements. They can't actually perform the task and the training. They fail repetitively. If they're in the field and there was a fire or something, literally people would die because they'd be unable to do their job. The response of the higher ups was to get rid of the sergeant and replace them with a new sergeant yeah. until you okay. get a sergeant, which the just goes along here, and but says, if I okay, mean, you're, you're, you're basically saying like uh, the technocracy is inefficient enough is the problem. Like they're they're allowing these like inefficiencies in for symbolic reasons or something. Is but, that but really again, what, I I, what I'm saying is, is that we can't delegate authority. We can't actually trust anyone to to take responsibility for their particular domain of, 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 of di different domains of society and actually give people so-called freedom, but not freedom. Ultimately, give them responsibility. It's not rights. Mm. Um, yes, everything is about yeah, rights. Right, right, right. That's the difference. No, but the responsibility framework and the duty framework is fundamentally different than the rights framework. Now, me, I think I'm like the only like LaBase trad Christian here, but I would say that the difference would be uh, between like the c conception of human rights that we have nowadays that's a, a secularization of the christian ethos and what was duty and dignity and uh the more ancient values uh that's obviously a point but i think but joel i think if i may interject what you and, and bard is saying are both saying i think you have commonalities here because what you've described with you know the the gender equity and the thirst for representation is what bard uh describes when within the decoration society where it's just the the um the the pseudo events and the signifiers for example the other day i saw this tweet by some histrionic journalist about uh oh you, you you don't care about voting because you know you're not voting about my, my fundamental human rights it's like as if voting can grant you human rights right so it's again a symbol of the the uh ex the the sort of thirst for identity and recognition from a very shallow surface one-dimensional uh aspect of this decoration of society that we live in the technocracy it's only sort of the surface level of granting you quote unquote rights and identity. It's but bourgeois. It's not really true. It's, it's, it's actually reactionary. Exactly. It's, it's bourgeois liberalism. It's, it's identity. A lar large body of identity politics is the PMC pro uh, professional managerial class, the managerial state this is, can I giving you a man? pale representation of some sort of authenticity that we've lost mm. when we've, went to the break into modernity, you know, around the 19th century. So, so, so a really useful term here, right? Um, this is what Kajev calls the politics of equivalence. It's not like the politics of equality is that of aristocratic societies. All aristocrats are equal to each other, which is why they oh, duel yeah. each other if they offend each other. But, you know, they would never duel a slave because obviously it doesn't fucking matter what a slave thinks. You just kill slaves. Um, the homo have, saker is another level of that. Yeah. The, the, the bourgeois politics is one of equivalence. So what that is, is about like, what's when people start talking about like equality of opportunity or saying like, you know, what's fair in a taxation system, like you have to do like a graduated tax or whatever. So it, it becomes like based off of like, what is fair for your, like, what's the fair percentage of representation? This is like how the bourgeois thinks of equality 
as it's it's the, the reign of quantity. Let's put it what it is. It's the reign of it's the term equivalence. So like what you would actually look like, like when you're saying like, okay, so they said we in order to be equal, i.e. equivalent, we need to have the equivalent amount of women in like percentage as there are in the population represented in blah, 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 blah. This is all very reactionary bullshit. It doesn't actually mean anything because what the like what a future oriented or like uh, one that was actually progressing towards the end of history as Kajev sees it would do was be not to even have like a differentiation between like the troops and just the workers like the worker it's like more of like a Junger's idea of the worker um the working state yeah because like you, you what do you like if everyone is involved in the economy then everyone's represented in it like you don't like this idea that it's like well we need to have equivalent representation at all levels based on xyz's demographics blah 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 that's just a way of eliminating like the concern over like the larger um differentiations but, but, in but class. that's that's not equality of opportunity that's a quality of outcome that's where rousseau comes into the picture and that's what rousseau is huge these days well we don't have a marxist left and longer we have a rousseau and left we have a rousseau and yeah. small woke people out there uh mao Hitler, Stalin, and Pol Pot all loved Rousseau, and that's why it's a dangerous time in, in that sense that the symbolic can now go violent very quickly. Yeah, but none and, of those people have that. Wait, much Hitler power. wasn't based. No, what? No, no. no. Okay. If, it, if it's a meritocracy, which I was, also love Rousseau. Okay, I hate Rousseau. Jesus, John, Play please, yeah. you're killing so, me here, buddy. The meritocracy, the meritocracy, what we're talking about, that was a bourgeois <laughs> ideal, and Dörder McCloskey and others have defended it. It makes sense. It's probably the best we can do. But the meritocracy is a quality of opportunity. But if you start to say that we're going to have more women here rather than having more men here, whatever, and we forget about whatever requirements you have in general, we're not talking about equality opportunity law. We're talking about equality outcome because you're looking at all of this as privileges. Mm. Yeah. Institutions yes. and privileges. That's we're why having it's a job and getting paid. Yes, exactly. Mm. That's why having a job within these institutions today means Let's getting the, the money. real reactionary. No, that's true. That's just that's true. what Washington, D.C. is. That's what that's what the European Union and Brussels are now. The, the institution has been around for too long. There hasn't been war. There's been too much of peace. Mm. And these long periods of peace create these really corrupt institutions that don't even understand that they're all about privileges. There's really no difference between Washington, D.C. and our market in Nigeria, if you look at it. And the Nigerians at least are aware of the fact that they're corrupt, so they leave. Mm. This, this also, is also the essence if, of neoliberalism as well here, that uh, market logic. Oh, one, yes, one, sorry, one, one quick thing, though. One quick thing I wanted to add. I am not as versed in philosophy as any of you guys. You guys are incredible. And everybody, please subscribe right now. Thank you guys so much for this amazing conversation. I just wanted to quickly mention the master-slave mentality that we were talking about before, which, as far as I understand, means that the slave becomes someone who would not really stake it all and fight to the death and would rather be subjugated. And that is my Until concern. Until they do. Until they do. Well, yeah, I mean, this is my concern when it comes but, to the last man. But the slave man. is just as important for that schema of recognition than as sure. a master. But now if we are in the uh, state of the last man being predominant, over our culture, like I don't know how long we're going to be able to exist until it all falls down. We have harder times, and then we have to rebuild again. So I'm curious if anybody would like to also uh, talk about this last man bug man syndrome that's going on right now, and how we can well, get out there's of that. No I feel energized, from that. guys. I Everyone's feel like that. A... <laughs> Everyone's that. Everyone's that. Everyone, especially the people who think most about it and talk most about it. Right. Everyone is already this. Like we don't have a history. We are all like these floating people we're floating fucking faces on a on an app made by zoom <laughs> right now like this is who you really fucking are. wait like, logo you're saying i can't have my base cottage core reactionary uh no you can even society. you can and you can instagram about it and you can turn it into a lifestyle brand you can commoditize it you can like do all you can sell t-shirts about your i can cottage have a cookbook shirt. about it yeah, yeah i can, can have, have a cookbook, cookbook. yeah you can do everything you can write uh, <laughs> cottage core short stories and sell them on amazon you could uh, do ASMR from your cottage core and uh, put, upload it to YouTube. <laughs> yeah, this is who we all are, <laughs> and great. there's there's only the only real differentiation now in a like in a global consumer society is between what uh, Kajev calls the snobs and the animals, right? Because there's no real conflict left aside from the conflict between people who say that all things are consumable and people who say that you know they wouldn't ever deign to eat such a thing. Joel, and what that's what that's yeah. what you know. People when they're like they're like, oh, I'm not some bug man because I refuse to consume some things. Like it's like I do no fap, right? Like this is not real. Bull this is all bullshit. If that's how like you have to differentiate Logo, no. yourself, it's over. 
Yeah, Mo- I Mogo refuse has this to particular eat style of offending people on Twitter that, by doing, but he is right. But I think Logo offends people because people deep down know that Logo is right in this regard. But they, I don't know. I have stro- we we talked about this before. Logo, I think that yeah, it's everyone partially- likes their self mythology because it's part of yeah, commoditize the, themselves. But even the mythos itself becomes commodified in in the sense that you're following sort of an aesthetic of rebellion. But I do agree that there's still One that's a spaces. No, but but I do agree that there are spaces within the culture camp. But I know you think the culture camp isn't real, but it's all I bullshit. Think it's all bullshit. But I I think there's still you know I, certainly I know that. Sorry, Joel, I cut I cut Joel off. I'm just well. That's another conversation. Well, no, like no, I appreciate how much of an asshole logo is because you need to be an asshole to you know yes not be led down uh, blind alleys and convince yourself of bullshit. But the question for me is okay. There's got to be something that we can fight for. There's got to be something that we can actually do. Yes. What do you? Because, okay. Because, exactly. Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. What <laughs> is wrong? Oh, cut him off. Don't cut him off. No, Don't I'm come saying. Off. But what? What do you need? What is missing? Like, is this Fallis. a personal problem? Or Fallis. Is this... Fallis. You, you need to feel your dick. You can reach down right there. You got a shirt that says "Private." No, I mean more than that. I mean a metaphysical sense. So I'm talking. I'm working with messianic stories now. I'm working with saviors, socials, <laughs> all those stories throughout history because this, that's all we got left. Oh, but but, no, no, but, but just wanting what I was say. wanting for the that. phantom phallus is like what we have no, no, to but, do. But, but you live in the <laughs> listen, guys. You live in the most effeminate period in human history. Yeah, so you, you gotta want the dick. The I want the dick. We live in. So, <laughs> we gotta we gotta learn how to wa- strive for the phallus is what you're saying. Because some of you guys but, to bard the phallus is sort of like an archetype, a drive of civilization. Very homoerotic. No, no, but but I think what Alexander the phallus is like Faustian man is that the model that like. Like is the phallus Faustian man? Is it like the the essence of civilization striving for itself? Like a huge, Heidegger, Heidegger, a huge dick Heidegger, fucking Heidegger, the Heidegger. vagina of infinite space. It's the Thanos space. with the yeah. huge yeah. cock porn thing. Well, the we energy, the energy the of the, the longhouse. We have to resist the mother in the longhouse by using the power well, of the cosmic. Well, if, if I may uh, bring up a point, so, sorry, a logo, and uh, this actually is not even really arguing against your point in particular, but I think once you're underneath a like commercial capitalism it's it's if anything it's not that you don't want anything else it's that like you're kind of in which all of like society and human development has been liquidized into wants basically and products and like liquid modernity yeah that's what you that's what you see in history in in in, and that's i'm not i mean i agree with you but i and, and you have this uh situation like in politics where the entirety of politics has become products like abortion for a long a time that's been the case yeah no no i'm not disagreeing with you but i'm saying like i think another side of it is that there is no like place in which a like uh, a because all desires can be product become products they they, they like uh it, it kind of eliminates this way in which uh well i guess an alternative like dialectic would occur yeah yeah john if i may riff on that for a moment this is very similar to i recently completed even though she's totally wrong about a lot of things wendy brown's newest book on neoliberalism where she talks about the marketization of all life and how it, it, very similar to what logo is saying i'm going to post screen caps um where she says at the very end about, it's like, no, I think the chapter is called No Future for White Men. So of course she's got to talk about the bullshit about Charlottesville and the alt-right, all that fucking bullshit, right? But she she has this very liberal way of viewing it. But she says that the reaction to the commodification of all life is in itself something that you consume and commodify. So in a lot of ways, it's almost like horseshoe theory where she's saying that the way that the quote-unquote SJWs consume their identity is the way that... um you know, anonymous, you know, intelligent frogs on Twitter and 4chan consume the reaction to Absolutely. the marketization of all life. And I don't agree with her necessarily, but I do think it's a, a fundamental point. But I feel that we all cut Joel off, so I, I'm very sorry. Oh, oh, wait, before we no. get to, before we get to Joe real quick, Caustic oh, has God. a comment. Caustic has a comment, and he is one of our great patrons, so I have to address it, or else I'm not going to feel good about myself. So Caustic... must commodify this conversation. Yes, exactly. Everybody oh, speaking subscribe. Of yeah, yeah. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Throw up my print, throw up one of my prints that you can get yes. until the end of the month for $20 patron. And- 
I will send you one of my prints from that one no GF series. Woodblock Japanese Yukio prints. There you go. Yes. Yeah, that's one of yeah. Patreon. I need to make points anymore. We're, we're all just like commodity. Like, what is this even? <laughs> we gotta survive. No, here's the thing. We have to. I get it. I get I, it. I got. I gotta survive. I got. I gotta make a living here, starting with this thing by bringing in all these intelligent people to talk. But anyway, Caustic's point is: ask Logo if murder, serial cannibalism, uh, can make you distinct from the bug man, which is to say, to become <laughs> something beyond the scope of what we consider human. A Scythian uh, warlord yeah. would no. Not that's be, actually yeah. that's actually the end point of it, right? Like that's that's not even a meme. Like there's more. There's a lot of like that's why. Like that. The, who is the guy on the travel show who went and ate some like human brains? It's like Reza uh, Aslan. Reza Aslan. Yeah. Yeah. That's the ultimate. Like that's like, exactly. Like mm. think about that. Like for a travel show, this guy went and ate human brains. Like as a spectacle. Like no, I don't know. What what do you want me to say about but the that? idea like, behind? Yeah, I guess you can. The idea behind the agoris, and from what I understand, those weren't like legit agoris. They were just doing it more for show. But the OG agoris are supposed to be people who subject themselves to something that would break their idea of uh, dualism <laughs> and to go. Yeah, beyond I've it. lived with them in India, so there you go. Yeah, that's true. So and they take tons of drugs, by the way. So there you go. India does everything anyway. So, uh, but I, I I would add that actually. Uh, what we work with now in the new book is working with the concept of the bard absolute, not my last name, but bard, like in bard, like a bard subject, something is barred from you. The bard absolute or the closed absolute. And the bard absolute is actually that what happened was that with Christianity and Islam's pop religions and what we call the West, West of the Gobi Desert, got immersed in this idea that everything should be accessible to everybody all the time. And I think this is the beginning of the total commercialization and marketization of society. Uh, so it, it wasn't given that they would, this would happen. It's not given at all, for example, in Indian culture. It's an incredibly Western phenomenon. And it should be studied that way. And I think we need to go back to the fifth century actually to explore how the division of church and state actually then merged in the market. And the market mm, interesting, and everything. Interesting. And I think marketization, it, it's, it's not determined. It's not determined that it would happen. I think it's Hegelian in the sense that we need to go through the last man states, but it's not the end of history because actually you have to pass through it as an abstraction, it's negation, abstraction, and then find a new concretion. And I, I think I, it, it requires creativity on our part to get through it and find spaces that one, are barred for people who shouldn't be there in the first place, and two, cannot be commoditized. I just hear I just hear a golden age mythos where we're in a, the times of tribulation and then we'll get through Call them and we'll return to the golden age of prehistory. May, may I bring up a, a yeah. point? We all know. Uh, do we all know John David Ebert? Yes. yes. Unfortunately, so, he's got, he's kind of lost his mind recently. I don't know if you. Guys yeah, it's, it's because of sad. his ex girlfriend that killed herself. But that's not either or there. But so. but um, he he makes the point, uh, and I, I'm going to try to push this in a certain direction but uh he makes the point of uh that that the human brain can't get any larger to pass through the birthing canal like that we've hit the uh maximum like cranial growth for like natural births and i think there's a certain like i i hate to keep on rendering my point over and over again but it's just like i think um the complexity of society is definitely outstepping our understanding of it. Yes. We can always grow bigger. Agree. We can become and, the and Nephilim. And this and this um and this complexity it uh and the increase in like literal available energy is like kind of reasonably calls for greater control. Because well, that's what Nick Land said as well that society human complexity and I know Alexander Bard is going to disagree with this, but human complexity is such that, you know, with technology and with AI and all of that, that anything besides direct fascism would just be too complicated of a, of a political system to handle. So, no, I, I, know whether... I, agree, gee, I agree with you. It's called Sansocracy. What we're working on, mm -hmm. either you guys are all going to worship in Saksi and Pink Stick, and you can all go to China and have a career. I, I guarantee you can all go to China and have a career right now as academics in China. But if you want to have a response to Xi Jinping, then the Koreans and the Indians and the Taiwanese ask us and we work with them. I work a lot in Korea and Taiwan and work on models like, could it be that plurality actually makes more sense in the long run? Okay, 
the Silk Route is a good example of that. The Silk Route wasn't run as a dictatorship, and that's exactly why it was the most, most amazing human construction ever. It lasted for thousands of years. Whereas, for example, Akhenaten's Egypt lasted six years and then fell through the roof because when Akhenaten's Egypt was attacked by the Syrians, everybody was obsessed with building the new city for the dictator, so nobody defended the country, and they lost. And this is the problem with dictatorship. Take, for example, the Chernobyl series. Any kid can understand it's about the Wuhan virus. Chernobyl, which Joan Rank, a friend of mine, made, is the series that basically explores a system that is a dictatorship will sooner or later come to a point of corruption where actually nobody's reporting up to the dictator. I think I'm going to start the next book with Stalin's last five days before he died. Nobody entered the room because all his doctors agreed. None of us want to go into the room because we could all get executed if we do. So we let just the old man die on his own lonely. That's how you die for a dictator. I think it speaks volumes about what, and I'm not a goody guy at all. You know me, I'm not gonna do good <laughs> stuff. Or I'm beyond good and evil if anybody is. But I just think we owe it to tell people there could be alternatives to Xi Jinping's China. And the Western eye, which is looking at everything as marketization is desperately looking for the savior to get us out of complete utter commercialization and commodification of the world. Well, right. we got it. There are alternatives. We just have to think them. Get this, there. this is also the point I was trying to make, which was that you could say history has ended and, and, and be and dish out black pills and be a douche or whatever about it. But <laughs> the point the point is we have a fucking technocracy. We have mass financialization of like the entire economy, a bunch of capitalist parasites that uh -huh. through, through yes. the donor class completely like dominate our political system. And the they're driving our civilization. Let me finish. They're driving our civilization into the mud. Essentially, nothing makes sense. This bureaucracy is terrible. There is at least history insofar as let's take these fuckers on and try and like carve out spaces okay. in which people can be creative and take responsibility for things yeah. in a way that could create a better world, cool. a more interesting world to live in. That's so, cool. But like, how do you do that? Still. How do you do that? We well, do that we're already by... doing it. We're already doing it in Europe right now. Europe, yeah, because people are moving to countries like Estonia and Iceland and Czech Republic and Malta, where they can do this. And on a global level, you're moving to Dubai. And if you don't get what you want from the Sheikh in Dubai, you move to Singapore. And if you don't get what you want from Singapore, you move somewhere else. These are the global nomads that we talked about 25 years ago. They're already, it's already happening. This is the new super. They're class just capital, world. though. Those, these are just like the flu, flu no, capital. No, class, they though. would not agree. Their attention and capital and going towards communism meaning communism is voluntary. We create communist circles that we live in. Eventually, the autocracy is going to be communist in a voluntary way. That's where it's heading. But it, the, the way it's heading there is not through socialism, which failed. It's heading there through attentionalism, which we're at right now. Everything now is about the eyeballs and about algorithms from now on. And capital is secondary to that. That's why deflationary pressures are everywhere in the world economy. That's why you can go into any bank and get as much money as you want, as long as you want to spend it. Because capital is now reduced to secondary quality. The primary quality today, attention. Can you get anybody's attention for anything you do? If you can't do that, you're a loser. That means we have an attentionalist sub, a super class of hundreds of thousands of followers on Twitter, where some people only get 14 followers on Twitter. And next, it's about who follows you rather than how many you do it. We're now moving from quantity to quality in digital. That's the 2020s. And it's going to be brutal and ruthless. And it's all oh, but going to this be is, but, yeah. but this is what, like, Joel brings up an amazing point that I want to believe in, right? I mean, I, as an artist myself, I want to believe in this, but I, I don't, but, but logo is black, but logo is black pilling is sort of mm. swaying me the other way. No, forget I think, the black pills. I mean, yeah. we should think, forget, like, rather than disempowering yourself by saying, well, there's no hope, there's no hope. Let's keep thinking. Let's keep trying to yeah. work yeah. this out. Okay. And that's not what I'm trying to do. Creating, but that's not what I'm trying to do, guys. Though. That's, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not accusing, I'm not accusing. I think they're still here. thinking the after a, like a, this this in which the dialectic of the citizen becomes the primary relationship that uh takes place over history right right mm. well but, but that's that well again well, let logo make his point sorry yeah sorry, sorry yeah that's not really what i'm trying to say i'm trying to say here that like what you're uh, like you just have to think what you're saying through a couple more steps in like very realistic terms and then you start calling me a black pillar because it's like you're saying like, we need to do something, we need to think or whatever, we need to like challenge the system. It's like, okay, so 
that's what we're doing right now, ostensibly, right? We're all on this Zoom call. We're all talking about this in like very critical terms or, you know, trying to understand it. So to come up with some sort of alternative, but we're not coming up with any specific real alternative or plan to do this in real life in any actual way. Oh, I like, do. Yeah, I yeah no, paint, but yours, I yours is, I, that's the only I, can, thing I, can do. I can also fly to another country. Like, you know, that's not a revolution. No, like you're I, saying. I, work, <laughs> I, work, I worked in no, but we can't even last... do that nowadays. And no, wait, wait, Alexander, yes. I'm an activist. You should be an activist. You're a philosopher. You must be an activist. I just spent several weeks in Prague working with hackers. We're doing decentralized platforms because we hate big tech. It's going to make a hell of a difference. That's fine. But that's, but yeah, the big tech activism. doesn't hate decentralized platforms. Big tech has no problem with decentralized platforms. Oh, Tor, yes, they do. because it Tor was them. created by DARPA. <laughs> How do you explain that? This is all the OSS. I mean, it's also all, the, the internet the is already <laughs> a decentralized, or it's like a federalized network, but it's like, like it, it, I don't really see why basically the systems of control would really deteriorate that much in the face of decentralized networks. It actually yeah. makes it better. That's why a panopticon works is because it's actually decentralized. That's... There's only the illusion of the center. No, but, but that's right. I think that's a point that I wanted to bring up with, with, uh, with Alexander Bard when he uh, talks about the netizen. Uh, my response would be that, you know, Logo is right, that decentralized networks... And again, I, because I'm a Foucauldian, this is my shtick about, like, decentralized networks creating the societies of control. What would you say to the failures of the sort of tech utopianism, the Californian ideology as it's become known? What do you say to people, like, for example, in the book Protocols, that argues that the technology, digital technology, really isn't a rhizomatic entity, like, it's not a perfect Deleuzian rhizome, but rather it's it still feeds into an apparatus of control, but it's more it's a more sophisticated version of a panopticon idea. Like the Californian ideology people, like look at the way the internet happened. The internet used to be a million different islands on a virtual sea, but now it's being conglomerated. It's being corralled into controlled space by the big tech companies. So I'm kind of- Did I ever did I ever buy into the Californian ideology? No, no I'm I, not accusing you. I'm not accusing you, but- 30 years, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I agree with you guys. One thing we share as a value here, if you're going to do some sharing here, is that we are not naive, right? Right. We hate naivety. So uh, we want to be grounded. Mm. And that's really root of the phallus again. So we, we're Can you explain we a little bit more for the people who are asking what exactly is the root of the phallus? The root of the phallus is deep history. But it's deep history written from a point of a Hegelian way, like it was necessary to arrive here, but it's contingent and we have all the freedoms we want for the future. Meaning that the root of the fallacy is where do you come from? So, for example, in the Bible, it says he was the father and he was the father of he was the father of he was the father. And you have long, 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 long lists of people who, who, who have ancestries, right? This is to claim basically some kind of credibility to others. And this is what root of the fallacy means. It means that I go deep, deep, deep down into the history of ideas, way deep in the Greeks, and try to find some common threads and bigger stories and bigger narratives in there that we actually don't see the patterns of. It's like, if you're a philosopher, you wanna go as far away as possible from what you're observing, because the further away you get, the more connections you see that people don't see when they're too close to it. That's exactly my point. And if somebody else is behind you, he's the philosopher and you serve him because he's doing what philosophers should do. And it's precisely by going deeper into history, we can start looking to the future and maybe see patterns that actually make sense. Why is this a phallus and not like an umbilical cord? Good question, but umbilical cord is actually what separates us as units, so we're separated from the matrix. So I prefer to keep that in the other narrative, which is the magical narrative, and the mat matriarch that you're mad with from the day you're born because you cut your umbilical cord and forced you to live. So umbilical. So would you and, agree with uh, the I, three? The three we, we, we work with the mamilla, we work with the matrix, and work with the phallus. Please observe two of them are on the female body. So the matrix and the mamilla and the phallus are the three genital organs according to which we operate. So you would agree with, and this is like really controversial, obviously, but uh, you would agree with, like for example, um, Julius Evola's uh, conception of like the masculine and feminine, the solar masculine, the lunar feminine throughout human history, and like it's the resistance to that like primordial lunar feminine that the masculine, the phallic has to rise yeah. above. But what's and... important is the phallic must be split. And this was the great Zoroastrian insight. The phallic must be split. It's Shiva and Vishnu in India too. 
So the feminine is one, this matriarch, one bitch at the bottom, Kali or Miriam or The longhouse mother. Yeah, yeah, but you gotta split the phallus between the king and the priest. This is, un- this is where power splitting actually starts. It starts with separation of mind and body as specialties, as archetypes that worship one another, mutually admire one another, and then you got the empire that works. This is what the, what the, what the Iranians did, what the Persians did. They separated the Mobit and Mobit and the Shah and Shah must be separate courts, separate cities, separate capitals, separate, separate kingdoms, essentially. One of them royal, one of them priestly. By separating the two, the two phalluses, you can understand what a phallus actually is. And that's why young boys decide to be either of these two, but to be admired by the other, t- by the other team if they're the other one. So we separate the phallic in this sense, whereas because it's going to lead us. If you're going to have leadership, so it's going to go forward at the head of you. It must be both, both body and mind, pathos and logos. There must be both things at the same time. Whereas the oldest woman in the tribe just walks at the back, picks up everybody. If you're behind her, you're dead. Mm. That's Miriam, Aaron, Moses. You find this again and again and again in narrative, the, the story about the three. And it's the phallus that's split and it's the matriarchy that's one. And then... Instead, with the gentle organs, the feminine is, is between matrix and mamilla the first year of your life. And then after, you talked about freedom before. Freedom is essentially getting tired and hate your mother's tit. This is Julia Kristeva. You hate your mother's tit. Yeah. You must push the tit away. So you learn how to hate to protect and yourself. And that's the order of the father that Kristeva learned from Lacan. So yes, exactly. The and phallus is simply the word for where we're going to go. What do you want to be? What to strive for? What you want to be one day, but you're not yet. Exactly. That's would you also that big dick energy? In other words, would you also That's... compare it to uh, the uh, columns of Jachin and Bose, or severity and mercy that you find in all these different mystery schools, like the Kabbalah? You find it in Hermeticism. You have these two columns, and the idea is to go up through the middle, kind of balancing these two natures. And it does seem to me, at least, to be a way not to be stuck in certain cyclical patterns where the mother yes. it is cyclical and the idea is that you keep going you know beyond the cyclical pattern to achieve something greater and but that- you always return return this is, no. uh, this is the end no. of faust no that's no methodology for you but there's an alternative to that it is no methodology yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't, want to get too mis- I don't want to get too mystical here, but if we are talking about something like the big dick energy, that creative sexual energy can also go, at least with some like Kundalini, up through the spine, and that results in states of consciousness that are way more uh, intense than people usually experience. And as far yeah. as someone who's experienced yeah. that, uh, you know, leaning into that state, there definitely is something to that. Yes, uh, we have two dicks, one in our head and one between our legs, hopefully. Yes, mm-hmm. if we're meant. And yeah. in fact, if we look at some of the uh, ancient monuments uh, of uh, like, um, I don't remember their names right now, but like all the Sumerian gods, their heads was shaped like a dick, the kind of crowns that they wore. So they were these dick-headed entities. But uh, uh, yes, and don't forget to subscribe now that I have the floor. Subscribe, <laughs> subscribe, subscribe. God. And also, streamlabs.com slash break the rules and Cointree slash break the rules. This is how if you pay us money right now, I'm going full in. If you pay us money through Streamlabs or Cointree, Streamlabs takes uh, PayPal, Cointree takes Bitcoin and Ethereum. If you pay us, your comment is going to show up on the screen, and I am going to directly address it, and I'm going to force everybody to talk about it. Anyway, also, if you pay, also, if you pay uh, even more, if you pay even more, Lev and Joe will have promised to go to Gay Pornhub and make a performance <laughs> for us. Yeah, I was going to say, if you like uh, penises, you should follow me on Twitter. I talk about penises a lot. Also, also, um, subscribe to Jules' YouTube channel. Uh, Go and buy Alexander Bard's uh, collection of books. Also, got- buy Logo Daedalus' book. Yes. Oh, I was going to say uh, that. Oh, suicide. Guys. suicide. And buy my works of art. Please, God, help me. And I have nothing to, to sell. I'm going to potentially <laughs> have a website soon uh, because the Canadian government is very generous. Thank you, Trudeau. Thank you, Google. Uh, I'll say no more. Uh, but yeah, so subscribe to everyone. And uh, holy shit. What I you- love you I feel guys. like we're. I, I feel like we're. Uh, better than Curtis Jarvin. You're all better than Curtis Jarvin. Uh, no, but this is what I was going to say about. That's oh, not God, too hard to do. <laughs> hey, the Curtis, Curtis, is, a, Curtis is, a is a good guy. Yeah, I'm not, yeah he's on. a good guy. I, I just think that, for example, when we're talking about the societies of control, I fundamentally disagree with uh, um, with Molebug's analysis of the of the demic. Uh, I don't want to say the name because, of course, we're on YouTube. Uh, but I think uh, Giorgio Agamben's writing on the uh, global lockdowns has been much more illuminating than I think 
uh, Curtis is uh, writing about. He's a bit too optimistic. Uh, I mean, that's putting it lightly. Optimistic about the role of the post-Westphalian nation state uh, basically embracing some sort of isolationism because of a virus. I think that that's way too... If anything, they're going to clamp down on every single avenue of social interaction between individuals because this is the nature of neoliberalism and they're going to still have open borders, still have globalization, still have global uh, you-know-what, but they're going to do it by restricting uh, fundamental social relations. This is what Giorgio Ogama, I'm writing an essay on it currently uh, about, um, I, I think he's way better in this regard. So maybe we can f factor that into the end of history as such. Where do we see the role of uh, subjectivity within our own sort of epoch and with our own sort of uh, the digital reality that we're facing, especially now with uh, global lockdowns and people becoming uh, neats? Because the neats, in my opinion, we are the new aristocracy. Shall inherit the earth. Yeah, we shall inherit the earth. But what do you guys think of this uh, trajectory? I guess it's a pertinent topic. So, mm. I would also add one more thing into that, which is the uh, characters from the uh, time machine, the uh, LOE and the Morlocks, as far as these two different <laughs> ways that humanity yeah. can go. Like, this is also something that I'm thinking about when it comes to the lowest common denominator in an attention economy. Most people are going to go for that. Some people, like Logo was saying earlier, are going to make a marketing out of rejecting that and rebelling against that and make everyone go, ooh, he's so right, yeah. Like, forget about all these stupid people who are, you know, watching you know, Cardi B or whatever, like we're going to be these high minded philosophical types. But I know I don't know if this is necessarily going to create maybe like an idiocracy state for some people and for others who are having conversations like this, they would kind of become this new aristocracy of the mind and maybe of material wealth, uh, too. But I don't how know. do you it's become like an arist aristocracy without a sovereignty? Oh, a priest. Yeah, that's true. A priest and a priesthood. It's a priest that we're talking about. I don't about. want to be a priest. <laughs> I, uh, only the trickster would say that. There you go. Yeah, a sh shaman. I would like to be a trickster. That'd be cool. I like Odysseus. You are the trickster. Yeah. If you knew more about me, you'd know I was even more of the trickster than yes. you think. Yeah. Well, I am not surprised. Yeah. I'm a psychoanalyst. That's fine. <laughs> well, jo John is the, I don't know if you're the co-host, if that's the right way to say it, but you're, you take part in uh, Frank Hassel's videos. And for those who don't know about Frank Hassel, he goes around harassing people in public and trying to get a reaction out of them. And I would love for Gio in the future to paint uh, Jessica, who was the name that uh, um, Frank gave as Dr. Don Wario, the good doctor, to this poor dude that he was just following around the supermarket, telling him that he's going to uh, give him the bim bimbification gas because he's actually a woman. He needs to turn into a woman. And this old guy, he was just not having it. He was just trying to, you know, throw his phone at him and just getting really, really upset. And I don't know morally what to think about that. Like, I'm in kind of a quandary here when it comes to the- I Frank think Hassel if things videos. are funny, it's fine. That's the policy. And things that are funny, they're already over the line. Hmm. I know. Alexander, where do you stand on videos like that where people are harassed in real No one time? gets physically- Not physically, hurt. but like, you know- you... And you'd be surprised, by the way, the number of failed videos where it's like, you know, someone comes up to you and you go like, I'm going to bimbify you and sissify you. Most people will go, okay, and then just walk away. There's a certain segment of people who engage in that and give a reaction that, uh, you know. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's infotainment value. So infot everything is infotainment value now, isn't it? Yeah. Between us as well. But That's are we, we going go... to go both on? Are we going to go back to what was going on in ancient Rome when it came, comes to the gladiatory games where we are going to get like prisoners and instead of having them do several years, this is the point that Sticks Hex and Hammer 666 was making. Instead of having these prisoners stay in the prison, you would have them fight against each other, maybe to the death, maybe not, but like whoever wins, they would go free. Like, I don't know if right now we seem to be in a really padded existence if we would even accept something like that i just don't know like how low will humanity go before it's about time to uh, reset things oh we gotta go back to bullfighting to begin with <laughs> it's like i'm tired and sick of veganism and pacifism can't we just get out of that to begin with it's so effeminate mm. <laughs> boring well that is a big problem i mean joe what do you think is going to happen in the future what do I think is going to happen yeah, in the future? Yeah, just a uh, very broad <laughs> question for you, Joel. Uh, well, 
there's a couple things I think what is politically um, like looking at the current dynamic in the United States it seems like um, the hysteria of this kind of technocratic bureaucracy that I was talking about um, is kind of ramping up like you can see with the lockdown uh, paradigm and what have you there's like a flexing that's kind of going on um, and I think this is going to be um, a little more brutality in terms of, you know, the middle class got a pretty good deal after World War II. Um, but basically, I think we we're being lulled into like a blind side uh, where, OK, you know, you can have your American dream and like, you know, your 1950s wife and, and a car in the driveway and, and you can pay off your mortgage within your own lifetime feasibly and all these kinds of things. Actually send your kids to college without going bankrupt. That's coming to an end. Uh, the the necessity for the economy to be financialized exponentially um, is just kind of gradually enslaving us more and more. Um, and so I do think there's going to be an opportunity um, where, you know, a certain kind of coalition is going to get backed into a corner, uh, which enables history to come back alive, so to speak. And we can actually have some kind of political contest that is about more than like whether we're pro or anti-abortion or something, where we can actually have a kind of I mean, I can already see it emerging, a kind of like a cold civil war in the United States where, you know, demographic shifts um, and policy shifts ultimately alienate uh, portions uh, of, of the United States, probably like the red states, uh, Central America from, um, you know, the, uh, the dominant cities. And this could produce a kind of interesting conflict. Um, and so I think a lot of, I think everything is kind of feeding into that and positioning for that, whether that just becomes just another political conflict that goes nowhere or whether we can use this as an opportunity to actually drive some kind of historical innovation. Mm. And, and whether the West, is, like whether Spengler was right and it's a done deal or, um, you know, or whether we actually have some innovation left in our culture, because I don't really see much innovation coming from the Chinese or, or any of these other cultures. So I feel like humanity's only hope for more interesting shit is, it's us basically in the Anglosphere. Uh, I kind of disagree. The West. Yeah. A lot of the a lot of the more popular things that are coming out now are just like uh, like Western companies copying Chinese c companies. Like TikTok is like. Well, the TikTok major... is a Chinese company. That's what I'm saying. But like you know, yeah, but is no, TikTok I mean, I'm agreeing. Really like, is TikTok oh, you, really oh, like mean... culturally interesting? Oh, you I mean, yeah, it is. Net Absolutely. Netflix has finally proved that people in England, America, can actually watch foreign movies with subtitles. And it took them like a hundred years to get there. I think I think to think of the Anglosphere as some kind of culturally superior part of the world is actually really a redundant idea. Yeah, it's, it's really uh, it's really backwards at this point. Yeah, totally backwards. I mean, I would oh, probably chauvinistic, time. but the, my oh, point though God. is my, my uh, point. Within ten years, the majority of Netflix scripts will even come from India, not from America any longer. I mean, the majority of literature in the English language comes out of India these days, and not from America. So it just it just that shift is happening already because the English language is being picked up by everybody around the world. And as soon as they start speaking English, which they do now all over Europe, for example, it's only the last five years, that changes everything dramatically when it comes to culture. Well, as soon as you enter into, as soon as you enter into English discourse, as soon as you enter into, yes, but that's what happened in Sweden. Yeah. I started in the 1980s producing music and had number one records around the world, and, and suddenly Sweden was the number one music exporting country in the world. Why? Because we started speaking English. Our English wasn't advanced enough to make movies yet. We do that now, Chernobyl, for example, but. We could make pop songs. And yeah, I think Max Martin, right, has well, more platinum hits than uh, yeah, Paul McCartney. We're, we're old friends, worked together for the past 30 years. Yeah, he's But as, soon, as yeah. soon as you enter into the English language, because ultimately that's what the Anglosphere is, is English language speaking internet and culture. You're kind of being colonized voluntarily. No, by... I think the English language is not owned <laughs> by Nigerians and Indians, rather by people in England. And when it comes to the English language, nobody cares about England any longer at all. It's not even well, funny. I'm anymore. not saying anyone cares about England. I'm saying <laughs> you get colonized by the cultural form. Um, obviously, it, it's mutating and we're, and we're kind of we're taking in. I mean, I think the best thing about, you know, uh, American music uh, and even British music to a degree is taking in a whole bunch of African, uh, you know, musical forms, combining them. Yeah, with finally, Western technologies. Finally, and then, after decades, yeah. But the thing is this, if you're going to do AI, for example, in North America, you have to work in Canada, probably Montreal, because you have to think in at least two languages to understand what intelligence is. Not, to not speak two languages is a bit like not having a sense of humor. You don't mm -hmm. get intelligence unless you speak at least two languages. If you speak five, you get more intelligence. These are the things we're discovering right now. And we're discovering 
some of the first things we get out of AI, when AI can make us understand ourselves better, is the fact that if you can think in different levels at the same time, you get more intelligent. You talked about universal human rights before here. Well, universal human rights were invented 600 before Christ. Why? By the Persians. Yeah, when they colonized Babylon. Why did they do that? Because they realized we're going to create an empire, and empire is going to different layers. We can have different religions, different languages, different cultures on the different layers. That's exactly why universal human rights wasn't an issue about rights at all. It wasn't Christian. But just the idea that if you're going to run an empire, you better have different levels that operate in parallel one another, and then you have a sort of focus center of some kind, which is more symbolic. That's how the Romans did their empire too. That's how the Mongols did their empire very successfully. So the, the, these are the ideas we're interested in now. Can we create anything bigger than tribe? Because the question here that Gio brought up before was that about the individual. To me, individualism is, is the American religion that Immanuel Kant perfected and, and Descartes invented for the Americans. But to me, that's over. It was never the issue anyway. We're totally tribal creatures. And the real challenge today, can we get out of tribe? What the internet does is that it gives us tribe right away. It's called subcultures. So the question that Lev had before is that, so what would the future be like? I would say everything that absolutely can happen will happen, but it will happen in close subcultures and most of us will not hear about it. Mm. That's the most likely scenario. That makes me think about, and I've mentioned this before, but in the, uh, because I get really worried about that because in the gay science, uh, Nietzsche talks about uh, like that there will be basically a form of psychology that will be even more um, kind of, deranged and uh, dark than like how he describes the Christian psychology that will develop like an even more underground, even more uh, like life denying form. And I, I always like think about like the internet, like in, in reference to that, that, uh, that aphorism, the gay signs that like, I do agree that um, the, 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 deni- the dynamic you're talking about will happen, but it's like uh I think he sort of advocates, if I remember properly, uh, more towards the the, the Roman, because he, he calls it Napoleonic. And I, I should have brought this up earlier because of when we were talking about the Napoleonic code being uh, transported around the uh, world. It, but, uh, you know, that, that there's the, the sense that Nietzsche gives that the, uh, the Napoleonic is the fusion of the Christian and the Roman together. Um, and that at that point, the Christian, the Roman, like it's, it's now trying to... Uh, be uh, th- these things are again entering into a circumstance in which they're separating like again and in american culture like you still see the christian and the roman like coming together and mm-hmm. i also m- intended to bring it up before but joel i don't think necessarily your uh history of jurisprudence was uh i don't know if i agree with it because you have like the uh corpus uh juris Cui- uh, uh which was like the justinian uh had a like a it's kind of like the translation of the uh, the uh, New Testament with the uh, uh, the King James Bible, where they had this uh, the, these group of like the best scholars of the time. They came together and worked on a translation. You had Justinian brought together the great like legal thinkers of the time to kind of make a um, singular, clear document of the structure of Roman law and this and and the. Uh, and the way that it functions in the cases and the figures of Roman uh, legal theory. Uh, and this uh, document was extremely important in it to Christian law and extremely important in the Renaissance and the development of law after the fact and the development of the Napoleonic Code. Al- although the Napoleonic Code is like a very significant break from the history of Roman law. Um, but, you know, you, this... this um, this uh, position of uh, the, uh, oh my God, I <laughs> completely forgot my point. I'm sorry. Everybody subscribe <laughs> right now so that uh, John can remember his <laughs> oh point. Oh my God. That's going to well, help I've, him remember his point. Can someone help me? I, I got really, uh, I was thinking about Sky Vola and I got completely uh, uh, sidetracked and, and uh, kind of exploded into too many points. I know. Um, I mean, my uh, my concern, once again, is that if we don't have a society where people are still, like if we're talking about 99% of them struggling against some kind of, uh, you know, natural situation where you have to take care of the land, so you're kind of forced to learn how to grow food, 
how to know what the weather is like. If we're if most people are not going to have that, then eventually when we are going to have a shock to the economy, then we're going to have so many people that, you know, they're not going to be able to have anything. They're just going to be mobs roaming the streets like do you imagine going into the future that there would be, let's say, the richer neighborhoods oh, that would be? I'm sorry, I actually do remember course. my point. If you don't, oh, I do. I, yeah, I, I, I think mobs actually have some energy to them. And you talk about people having no energy at all. That's more like white trash people in West Virginia. They don't do mobs. That's underclass. It's a real mm. underclass, like the lump and proletariat. So it's like, I, for me, in my work, I, I'm a Nietzschean and I expect my students to hopefully be a bit Marxist. So that means that uh, my point is to find a new elite, define who they are, tell them where to go, and basically they're probably doing already, and write an exodology. So I do an exodology, that's what we're doing. It's be tight, right. How do you leave a paradigm and walk into the next one? How do you leave a territory to walk into another one? How do you leave fucking Europe when it's boring and old, do you move to America and conquer it or whatever? So these exoduses are throughout history and today on the planet, the exiled Chinese, the exiled Indians, the exiled Nigerians and the exiled Iranians are the four four populations who do even better than the Jews everywhere. So people who are migrants in this way do better than anybody else because they're on the move. This is exactly what we're gonna see. We're gonna see global nomadism happen. And I, I'm interested in, in, not only this is, this is a physical space, but of course, mentally it's even more important. What does it mean paradigmatically to move into digital completely and immerse yourself in it and then become aware in that kind of environment? I'm interested in those questions. I think philosophers should be interested in it. It's a response to Nietzsche to say that no, other things are possible. For the vast majority of people, they will end up with depression, bipolarity, all kinds of psychiatric disorders. We're going towards 99% of the population now having psychiatric disorders. Why? Because they can't get it. They don't understand it. They're completely confused and they hate themselves for it and they lose it. Yeah. But uh, you can't have, That's you gotta have re-territorialization as well as deterritorialization. So if you want to move, move into these smooth spaces or what have you to use the Deleuzian terminology, but then you have to trace lines that ultimately can striate and so there has to be a kind of return, like the, the shaman goes out from the community, you know, takes mushrooms or whatever, experiences uh, divine entities, but then returns to the community and then you know, provides insight. Yeah, but that's what they, I'd, I'd love to do mushrooms with you, by the way. Here's a flirt, okay? So hey, anyway, but the shaman goes back into the tribe. He goes out of the tribe, back into the tribe. It's still within mm -hmm. the same tribe. I'm talk about the entire tribe moving from one. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's fine. But there has to be some kind of, we, there's no there's no like clean exit where we can just find our own space out here and just watch everything else just collapse i think there has to be some kind of return because yeah. at the moment there's no we're living we live in a globalized world where there isn't really i mean you know space travel kind of isn't working out too well there it doesn't seem oh, to be ever that heard much of, anywhere close ever heard of gated communities have you been to dubai it's one huge gated community it's not like you have to worry about the rest of the world if you don't want to have anything to do with them any longer i mean if you want to be an elite and you don't want to isolate yourself i, I, I don't back. think you have a choice yeah, I mean, if, geopolitics if I can make a, a is small real point I, I i i like i for many many years uh i've uh from even when i was re really young i would go for really long uh walks and i live in the suburbs in the new york city area and uh if you walk for, I've walked, you know, for six hours, you know, you know, five hours, you will not see anybody outside in suburbia. I think it's very possible for people to really, most people kind of have totally receded it completely from being involved with the world as it is. And that's like almost yeah. the natural tendency in the circumstance of what's going on now. I mean, mm. people don't go outside for months. I mean, really, like they literally go from, the garage and the cars in the garage and then it automatically opens and then they go to the interior of another garage in in i i live in new jersey in in in, in uh, there's a, a city called fort lee which is uh, basically been colonized by koreans um and it's it's actually like one of the most advanced um, cities in the united states i'm not even kidding uh they have the uh they, a lot of these large apartment complexes they have a 24-hour bus system that goes in and out of New York City, back and forth to different parts of New York City, and then directly back into the apartment complex. And it's like, um, I do think that it, you can take the, the sense of the world going on before this circumstance that we're in, and you can criticize what's going on. But I think most people are all attempting to get away from the world and like, get inside of the interior or something they're not really like this is the the major 
like interest of most people, I guess. If, if, and I think that it is very possible to like not involve yourself with the, mm. the world at all. And though, like, it's almost that like the world wants to, like, you have like something like Uber Eats. It's like that's the actual desire is to like get away from the world and to look onto it almost. Yeah, but then what I fundamentally agree with that. Yeah, that's mm. that's the whole point. That's what Giorgio Agamben was saying about the current situation is that um, there there's a fundamental di- discon- disconnecting of all social relations. And from my thesis, I feel that this is why I mean that you know my thesis about Nietzsche is that uh, there's a whole generation of young men in particular who are perfectly equipped to deal not perfectly, but they're sort of more than most equipped to deal with the reality of mass social distancing and not going out of your room for months on end. And, but it's a hellscape at the end of the day, because there is such a, sorry, if I'm cutting anyone off, I just came back. So you know. no, no, this is perfect. And I also, no, want... what I wanted to push against, yeah. I wanted to push against, um, sorry, sorry, love. No, go off? push against it. Push against. I it. wanted to push against Alexander Barr because I know that he is a uh, cosmopolitan. And I do agree that cosmopolitanism is something that has existed throughout human history, but I, I don't, I side more with the Heideggerian Nietzschean uh, dimension of locality and, and uh, rootedness and things of that nature. For example, Nietzsche said that, um, and I think it was in the birth of tragedy where he said that cultures that had one voice and one language, they produced the best poetry because they had a common sense and a common sort of place in the world that they could understand each other with. So I would push against this sort of like global cosmopolitan order. Not that say, I'm not saying that Alexander Bard is, is saying that I'm saying, because, you know, I would want to live in sort of a, you know, more based and creative cosmopolitanism than what the globalists want or whatever, whatever you want to call them. Oh, one doesn't speak. contradict the other. This is why we're working with nation. I think the ultimate nation is the Jewish nation. Why? Because the religion nation at the same time. The irony is, of course, the state of Israel is the perfect nation state you could ever create. So Jewish religion is nation and religion to combine. What the Persians try to do is to do empire. That's exactly why the Persian Jewish connection is so fucking interesting and why the Persians sponsored the building of the second temple in Jerusalem. They mm-hmm. love Judaism because the Judaism is the perfect local religion, whereas they created the global religion with no competition between the two. To the Persians, this were only two layers. It's an iconology at the bottom, that anybody could anybody speaks the same language can relate to each other. Here's a tribal context. We can also have an imperial context on top of that. There's no contradiction between the two. So I would say you're absolutely right. That's why I defend nationalists today. I think nationalism is, is now in Europe is rising and is great because it's the only thing beyond tribe that people can comprehend and trust. Right. But cosmopolitanism is the trade routes, it's the silk route. And that's just the stopovers. These are the city states like Dubai and Singapore on the map where you trade and you go along the trade. And that that's where you travel and people who travel all the time go from one place to the next and then they go back to their home. Canada. I think I, think yeah, I want Canada to take, I want to, I want to have the chance to be a bit of a cynical asshole here too and say, well, geopolitics is real. So you can go, okay, we can all move to Estonia and have some tax-free startup or something and hang out. Go and to mushrooms. Hungary and get a base travel. Yeah, but at the end of the day, like the, the geopolitically dominant positions in the world are going to be held by some Eurasian power at the moment, China, and America's in a great position just geostrategically so even if they're run in a retarded way they're still going to be able to amass serious amounts of resources and they're going to have massive intelligence agencies that are committed to kind of psychological psychological warfare and propagating bullshit all over the world so you create your little cool country where you have your you know, hipster ideology. Listen, Joel. If you don't, if Joel, you don't fit into a larger geopolitical paradigm, they're just going to fuck you over. So you have Joel, to figure the out how three to fight on, on, Joel, that, on that highest scale. Joel, the three million Chinese communist censors cannot beat the shit out of the 40,000 hackers in Taiwan. The hackers beat the shit out of them all the time. You can, with your VMP, access anything you like on the Chinese internet anyway. This is a yeah, Taiwan is an American protectorate. And a lot of yeah, the hacking technology no, it's, that you're it's run by, by the CIA. It's run by 24 million Israel fucking Muslim. Chinese people, right? They run it and they love it and they want to be Taiwanese. No, what you could, I would say this, if you compare Estonia as it is today and communist China today, which system do you think is the most stable over the next 20 years? Look, what's oh. Estonia. 
Stability Estonia, for who? by far. For who? Exactly. Stability. But Estonia is who, stable because it's irrelevant. I mean, if Estonia became relevant, it would become unstable. Like you're telling me that relevant say, Estonia to became a point of geopolitical conflict between the Americans I and the Russians. I don't care about the masses. You get a civil I don't war care like about that. quantity. Joel, I don't care about no, quantity I think and masses. I don't do mass Quantity meat. cares about you, though. No, yeah, I yeah, care about my care exactly. tribe. I care about my yeah. tribe and the quality of my tribe, and I don't care fucking about anything else. Yeah, I care about my tribe too. So you got to look at threats. You got to look at like where do I actually, Alex, where do I live? Part, What's my environment? True. But Alex, true. you were pushing against ethno nationalism and a lot of other talks. Like, what is your take on? I, I have sympathies for that sort of way of thinking. Although I wouldn't consider myself an ethno nationalist, but I do have sympathies for that framework, although I do think that na nationalism itself is a modernist invention, but it's the best that we have currently in t to push back against global liberalism. So I don't know, where, where do you stand? I I'm okay. confused here. So you I'm confused a cos me, Mr. Bard, yeah. you confused no, no. me. I am Hegelian, so I'm a cosmopolitanist, but I also defend nationalism. I defend any system bigger than tribe. We can urge people. This is priestly work. Okay, what do the priests do? You get two rivers flowing down to the Mesopotamia. You're going to have one civilization along the Euphrates, one civilization along the Tigris. They're going to go to war with one another, and they did that for about a thousand years. Tons of bloodshed. Until the priest thought, maybe you could come up with a narrative here and build a ziggurat in between the two rivers, and that we have one stereo from Euphrates, one stereo up from the Tigris, and we say that actually the two gods in Tigris and Euphrates are the same, are sons of the same Uru god. Oh, we have a shared religion. We can start marrying our children and shit. And you get at least a period of peace during which you get trade and prosperity. That's the way I look at human history. The trick is here to find out which systems work in the longest term possible to create systems of trade and prosperity until they've gone so fucking decadent they fall apart. We still I, always felt I have, I have, I just, what, what's, my uh, question is like, how do you, when in history, and I'm not saying this hasn't happened, but just like when in history or how often in history does, is there really this like vertical placement of a system in response to a criticism and like an and, 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 and adoption of like a, a, a system of, of rule? I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I know it kind of sounds like it's formulated. Like an axial age, in other words, like a yeah, like when. But I'm not, and I'm again. I'm just like actually genuinely asking, like of instances of that. I'm not like saying that. Like, has that ever happened? We had a hundred years of peace in Europe between 1815 and 1912. If we're generous, hundred years. Mm -hmm. Populated three continents. Enormous prosperity. Economic growth was tremendous. We called it the golden age of industrialism. It basically, was peaceful. A few mm -hmm. For who? <laughs> For the oh, Europeans. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. For oh, the yeah. Europeans. Oh, for the Europeans. Oh, okay. Not That's for anybody else. Let okay. Logo, maybe yeah, make Logo, logo will make a okay. longer point. Okay, yeah. but within the European context, the Germans and the French and the British got so fucking big headed that they blew each other up in 1914. And they did it again uh, with a, a fake phallus called Hitler, another fake phallus called Stalin. Uh, you know, you know, and 100 million men died. And we lived since Nick Lund. Hitler and Stalin with dildos. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah, after 1945, we had no <laughs> phalluses around because we killed them all. So, you, you know, we live in an incredibly effeminate, Americanized teenage world or something since that. So we try to make it slightly more adult and, and maybe more phallic. Mm -hmm. and, and we can maybe turned around unless somebody I'm trying else to understand is your problem really that there's like spike tv isn't on anymore or something like what like what's oh. missing <laughs> and, like need, i don't i really don't need... understand like ufc is one of the most pop like I, everyone talks about like this demasculization or whatever but i don't see it like i don't get it like no I'm, because it's so football it's so, football so is the national it. faith of my country and it's more yeah, important but we're we're saying, it's not like life and death maybe, maybe in it's sweden everyone's a bitch masculinity. But... yeah <laughs> well, hold on. Oh. to be fair need, to be fair to is this real masculinity death match wrestling all right one second to be fair to alexander this is real masculinity to be fair to alexander america is a country where even the football players are obese yes that's so fucking effeminate Okay, okay. Most Americans sit down, eat their burgers and nachos while watching the game. They're not participating in it. And I think That's this is exactly. Roman citizens did, though. Was it bad? Was it was it cucked to go to the gladiator games or was that masculine? Uh, near the end of the empire, it pretty much was cucked. Yes. I mean, well, I, th on, I think what we're getting to okay. is more, All right. I don't we know. don't have Boy, that let's much. Let's get Logo to make a bigger point because Logo hasn't spoken for yes. a little bit. So. Speak Logo. Go for it. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not speaking because I just don't really like understand the point of what anyone's talking about. Honestly, like we're getting like really deep, like trucked into the weeds here, and like just dropping a lot of like vocabulary. But I'm not really seeing what this means or like what it matters to anyone. What because, it like, matters? I'll tell you what matters. I, I think it in very concrete terms. I want to stop the massive <laughs> pandemic of depression <laughs> and bipolar among 23 year old men in North America and Europe. Mm. A pandemic of what? That. 
I want to stop the massive pandemic of bipolarity and depression among 23 oh. year old men in North America and Europe. It's a very concrete goal. That's pretty good. I mean, I think that China they need that does that they a need, lot better. Yeah, they need because right? they ban pornography. And, and, Right, China's banned pornography. And I agree. They've also no. they've also put limits on how much people can game, because you have to use your state ID to log on to things. And if you game too much when you're underage, you're just not allowed to do it anymore, unless you're like going to use a VPN or something. Well, so I think it's still about the narrative, and when it comes to the narrative, the Chinese are incredibly boring, so they don't make it. You know, it takes more than that. It takes much how much more Chinese culture do you read though? Like how many Chinese novels? I work in, in China. Times do you read? Still do for some strange reason. I still work in China. Because, like, I mean, I'm just saying, like, it's not like they don't come up with stuff or that everything that they do is, like, culturally They irrelevant. mimic we very just... well, and they mimic on large scales. They're the archons of uh, the human world. Well, they were always being conquered by steppe people, uh, the noble steppe people throughout history, uh, because they were largely, a, from what I recall, a peasant, like, agrarian-based society. Uh, th I think this is the problem I, I feel with a lot of uh, the... The spheres that we, well, some of us come from uh, on the online right, I feel that you there's a seductive trap of romanticism of a, that, now I think there can be a right wing version of third worldism, but I feel that there's still a sort of a seductive orientalism that maybe we're, we're because they're out, not the West, because they're not the uh, globo uh, liberal Western Anglo sphere, that we're looking to the outside, but the outside is fraught with their own problems. Hence why Joseph Campbell back in the seventies said that to these hippies, he's like, well, don't, you know, don't reify the cultures of the outside because they're equally filled with like mm. problems and conflict and charlatanism. Mm. So I, I would caution against yeah. this romanticization of other cultures. Uh, I don't know, maybe we're just fraught to be terminally rootless Westerners. I don't know. So, yeah. Oh, I agree with you, dear, because when I study South Korea and Scandinavia, they're the same these days. Why? Because yeah, they use more smartphones and more Wi-Fi than anybody else. Oh, it's because they're both years. projects of, like, the CIA. Like, right? Like, Scandinavia? Like, <laughs> 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 and, and, and is that necessarily such a bad thing, though? Because right now we have all kinds of projects. Love, we do no, have projects. No, no I'm no, going to do it. I'm no, going to do it. No. I'm going to do it. No. There are projects of the CIA, and then there are also projects of the Russian government that pay people people money to disseminate certain pieces of information in order bullshit for... bullshit no, Lev. Bullshit. no not bullshit <laughs> putin is the most based leader alive right now i'm sorry lev that's a facade I it's a uh, this up with it's you. as uh, <laughs> it, it, what is it called a potemkin village all of russia is a potemkin village for the intellectuals who go there who go on russia today and they have a certain perception of what russia is <laughs> and that's uh, that's all there is to it as far as i'm concerned no, yeah, but I you left there. your country when, because like, what was your like? I'm, I honestly think like, what what class was your family when you left? Right, like you could afford to leave, right? It was very tough to leave. We had to go to various bureaucrats and kind of convince them, like, please let us you go. You paid them. No, I don't think we paid them. We had family. <laughs> they, it's Russia. Of course, that's what you do. Of course, you pay. I'm gonna go into that. I'm gonna go into that. Let's not go we had down family. This road. We had family that was living Jesus over here, Christ. and that's how we were able to get here. That's number one. Number I'm so two. Sorry, back Lord. when I'm we so were sorry. living in Saint Petersburg. <laughs> Putin and his friends, they were smuggling cocaine into the St. Petersburg Harbor, and it was yes. not the uh, mayor of St. Petersburg that was in charge. Uh, it was actually Putin who was the deputy uh, mayor at the time. So when people talk about... So like, he was oh, doing what the CIA does. Cool. He was doing what the KGB right? does. Confused. and went, no, he, Yes, here, with, I'm going with to their unconfuse you. I'm going to unconfuse you. Of course, the CIA is a bunch of crooks. Any intelligence agencies are always going to be a bunch of crooks. At the end of the day, we're always going to be faced with choosing the best out of the worst possible choices. Uh, so right no. now, if we are talking about living under the kind of conditions that the Russian people Vote live for under... for Barabbas! <laughs> the kind of conditions that the Russian people live under, neither the uh, <laughs> Latvians, nor the Lithuanians, nor anybody there, nor the Ukrainians want to live under the thumb of that kind of uh, government government where 80 to 90 percent of the tax revenue is given to Putin's friends and they use it to build infrastructure projects that immediately fall apart and they want the citizenry to uh, kiss their fucking ass all the time. So that's the not the kind of I don't know. That sounds like America. We do that here. That here. Yeah. <laughs> here. No, here's the thing. Everything uh, is but, relevant. But the thing is America just has way better like 
geostrategic position where it can actually pump out way more industry so you can siphon yeah. so much it's more not just about there's still that. more left it's not for the just rest about of that. us it's not but just Russia's about got that. fuck all like you yeah, have no. to basically we, spend half basically, your economy on the military to make it work basically so. the only exactly. difference is that we're Russia in the 90s right now as opposed to Russia in like the 2020s because this whole graft right like it was working when it was getting uh, you know the trickle down economics and it was uh, coming down to the people ostensibly but and I mean that's what they said in the Soviet Union too until you know they had to do perestroika and you know destroy the whole country but that's doing it right no, that's what's thing, happening to us right now we're just Russia not getting the uh, logo yeah. here's the thing about destroying the whole country during perestroika what ended up happening was russia had all these reformers who came in and who tried to convert the economy from the yes, economy the chicago that was school controlled by the state from the economy that was controlled Economic by the state bands, yeah. to more of a free market now sure you could say yeah that so they a sold of... it to billionaire oligarch they gave all the pu they sold off all the public assets and gave them to the criminal class that had already existed and were were very good at capitalism because they were the only ones really doing it right no so because here's the thing you're going to have people of course that are going to be very corrupt in that kind of state but it's a transitionary period from which when you had putin who just became president you also had the prime minister and the rest of the liberal government being the ones that actually got russia out of the debt situation that it was in people love to s subscribe that to putin and say oh what a wonderful guy he got rid of the oligarchs he got rid of russia's debt all that he did was continued the same policy of corruption back during when he was the uh, guy in charge of St. Petersburg. And he just took money away from one uh, group of people and gave it to another group of people and continued yeah. this fucking thieving economy. Okay. And guess but what? Those same, people, love, love, those same we... people had their bank accounts and still have their bank accounts and real estate in foreign investments. All the investments in New York City, in various places in Europe oh, yeah. where their kids hang well, out. Well, the Chinese are doing that right now in Canada. That's what everyone here. does. That's what Absolutely. Doing, yeah. But the point that's is that... That's what the elite does the, in every country. It's like you I, just said, you have yes. to choose between the sides, right? So yes, it's like the we're question... choosing between a side, which is basically a country of lawyers. So like America or not like America, we still have a situation where, for example, we are not going to have, at least right now, maybe it'll change in a couple of years, but right now, we do not have a situation like you have in Russia, where an old man who writes a comment basically saying that, oh, they shouldn't have arrested this young girl for protesting against the government. That old man, like 75 years old, he gets arrested by the government and muzzled and just put on display like a fucking animal that's the kind of situation yeah, like here like here Russia. if you have dissident politics you get your bank account ripped from you and you get censored by social media it's the same fucking uh, <laughs> you know, you and know that's not I mean? good either but what, it's, what a, it's like it's a little more honest you might say like wouldn't it be actually better it in a sense more. if everyone why started are, getting arrested why are you guys to arrest why are people? you guys even so obsessed with these very unstable large systems. I mean, I am a big proponent of small city states, and I think that's the future. That sounds nice and all, but that's not like we're in an age of empires, and like I don't see that ending no, anytime we don't. soon. We're not but, but I do it. feel, but I do no, but Mogo, I feel that when things get more fucked up, I would side on on Alexander Bard's thesis because when things get exponentially fucked up for the Leviathan. There will be more opportunities to seek adventure, but there will be also more opportunities to drop out. So yeah, uh, but no, like yeah. this—that's of course, like yeah, yeah. Uh, I, like but that's ultimately like who do these like sort of you're talking about kind of like mercenaries, right? Ultimately, like like who's but, the free but also, nomad is like oh, the mercenary. mercenaries and prim people that want to go back like back to the landers. There will be more opportunities for people to either drop out or do like the Weimar Germany free corps thing. I don't know. I think that is, it's it's sort of a butchered historical analogy, but I, I do think that here's the thing. This is, you know, I study Weimar Germany because I, I am an, 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 as a painter, I'm very influenced by the German expressionists and what they were painting. Uh, they were very coming very close to the realities that we're having now. For example, Kirchner painting these uh, German, you know, prostitutes, same with Otto Dix. It, 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 they really were describing a time of chaos and chaos comes about when you have the, the this sort of a long house feminine energy re-entering. Uh, I don't of, know what this means. Well, no, no, no. What I mean is that, you know, we're experiencing a time now of, of decoupling and deconstruction and chaos. And that comes usually about from the rise of the feminine chthonic energy. So a lot of my art criticism writings, for example, I talk about uh, this, this postmodern, in, you know what what they call what the po perennialists call the counter initiation which is the profane aspect of a turning of the divine into the into the material it's it's the in grand inversion and what we're seeing now is a postmodern inversion 
uh, a return of the eternal chthonic mother in society mm, and usually yeah. when things happen around that time it's very fucked up i reviewed a gallery uh, a contemporary art gallery that was called abortion is normal i did this in the beginning of the year where a three-part 70 pages where i talk about uh uh for example uh lena dunham's parents were both in in the gallery by the way oh. uh and so i review it it's at uh, rocker reviews i will send it to you guys uh and where i talk about this uh using Camille Paglia, this sort of social return of of the, the lunar feminine, of the, the distorted postmodern politicized version of the Chthonic. And usually when that happens, things are all bets are off, things get fucked up. The masculine phallic order is, is being destroyed. So I don't know what you guys Yeah, think I mean that's a, yeah. that's the state of the end of empires. Yes. Right? Exactly. So we're, I'm yeah. saying, I'm saying, we're, I'm not saying like it's going to be empires forever. I'm saying that we're in a state, in a, uh, a stage of empire, right? There are just a few empires in the world, really. Right. And they're why not are we go in a state of fast. why are we in a state of empires? Because of because of the uh, the particular uh, contingencies of technological progress, like in the 20th century. Like it, it just became necessary. Like what, what, okay. You're talking about the age of peace in Europe, right? In the 19th century. Isn't that just because all of them became empires? No. You could even like take Quigley's angle on this. And he talks about the history no. of military technology. No. Let, no, let me, no, let no. me cover it. No, 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 let me finish. Quigley, Quigley describes how you have military technologies change throughout history. And the only times where you get democracies emerging in, you know, uh, early modernity, Western civilization and ancient Greece is when you have military technologies that are easy to universalize because they're very cheap and durable. So you can get a whole bunch of citizens together with, you know, cheap guns or cheap swords or whatever and like wage war. But then you eventually get an oligarchy that sets in and military technology gets more complicated and we can't get together and get like a few nukes and like, you know, do drone strikes on, on the government or whatever. So, you know, we're sitting here with our AR-15 from Kmart or something. And, <laughs> a bush and you, know, yeah. you know what I mean? And they've got like, you know, billions of dollars of like psychological warfare research and like the poison, they, they got, you know, all, all, all kinds of craps happening to us. We can't do shit about it because of just the barriers to entry. And, and this is just the reality. Like if you're thinking about this, not like a merchant, who's just a kind of like a parasite that wants to exist on the edge of an empire, but about someone who actually commands an empire or like engages on that level, you have to think about how do you actually fight? And if you don't have the material resources to fight, you're reduced to a parasite. You're not actually able to engage with these like world historical entities that are, you know, the empires that exist right now. So you can just kind of wait out their collapse on the edges um, or you could actually or try you think about or you leave. But there's no way to go. There's no way to go. You just yeah. you can only yeah, no basically to... exist upon upon their you fringes. More to, you're just saying go to the fringe of the empire and then wait because mm -hmm. that's going to be the first place that well, the empire. Well, when you do, empires are no longer physical. Empires are vertical as much as horizontal. No, they're everything's virtual. Vertical. As well. there's, there's, virtual. Everything's physical. Everything's physical. The internet is a physical entity. No, 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 wait. It no, is no, wires that's not what and I satellites. Meant. No, that's not what I meant. That's not what I meant. Switzerland is doing very well without being an empire. Thank you. Switzerland's absolutely an economic yeah. and financial empire. Exactly, vertical empire. But would Switzerland oh, be able to resist? The elite need somewhere to do their banking, so Switzerland yes. gets left alone. But also, for any yeah. of the other countries, <laughs> would they be able to exist and party on if not, let's say, for all these various military bases of the U.S. and Switzerland NATO? perfected the grift. You know, like, Switzerland could be an example of maybe a country that doesn't necessarily need it because they have all these various missile defense systems. But for most of the countries, they do kind of depend on there being this super Superpower that would guard them against an even worse superpower, and that's the unfortunate state of things. And I'm really sure what exactly but, could be done about that. But maybe think, to push. I think the Europeans are way too corrupt to go to war. They just not too. Uh, I'm not worried about the Europeans. In case you didn't notice, I'm, I'm not, worried more. I'm about not really Russia clear on why corruption and warfare are somehow separate, like and, and are, are like deny the other. It, it's real in Taiwan and Hong Kong and China. And I think the invasion of Hong Kong this year is the new Poland, 1939. But I mean, like there was corruption during World War II that was pretty severe and in Nazi Germany and- Yeah, but it didn't last long. The Nazi Germany was doomed from day one. It was- Sure, doomed. sure. But I mean, I, 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 I'm per, per, I don't, I mean, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but I, the, difference, the difference was that communism had like what, 70 years to flourish and then fail. Whereas, you know, a lot of these commie LARPers, they say that, you know, communi real communism was never tried because capitalism, you know, the CIA, they tried to fuck, fuck them up well, or something. 
but really like fascism really has that claim because fascism was destroyed by the outside. So we never, not that I'm defending fascism, yeah. but mm, we'll I see. Don't know, but let's be more you know, Kajevian here. Where, what is communism? It's America. America is the most is successful the communist country. Communist country yeah. Yes. No, but then I come I, full circle back to mold, but that was weird. Anyway. Yeah, sorry. I know. But I, feel <laughs> that, but I feel I get, I, I get Alexander's point um, that we're sort of, in a way, the Leviathan is going to fuck you over, and and I don't agree with like either, uh, I don't know, some like LARPy ethno state or some like Rod, Rod Dreyer like Benedict option. But I do feel that when empires fall, there always will be an inevitable uh, pocket of fugitive freedom and autonomy within the margins of the empire. So, for example, in the Soviet Union, you had a flourishing of a post brutalist architecture that was done in places like uh, Estonia and uh, Moldova and places like that. There's actually a book on it uh, because they were given sort of freedom away from the eye of Sauron of Moscow. And so they were allowed a certain sort of fugitive autonomy when great empires fall. But that's not realistic nowadays because of course the societies of control where things are, you know, the the real is being colonized by the virtual. I feel that unless we do some like, you know, OG uh, hacker slash geocity slash dark foresting on the internet. I don't know. I think that the, the Leviathan, they're going to get us either way. So I don't want to be a skeptical. By the way, but, it's going to be GeoCities yeah. spelled G-I-O, GeoCities. Oh, Those there are the you kind go. Of well, we, there is NeoCities now, yes. by the way. There's NeoCities. And by the but, way, I do, uh, I, do want to fall on, uh, I do want to fall back on something that uh, was talked about before with Russia. Logo was talking about like, oh, my family could afford it. We couldn't afford fucking toilet paper, nor did most people uh, have the ability to afford I'm toilet sorry, paper. I'm sorry, Lev, but you had, fam- you had family networks out side of the country which yeah which like other up your family other people ended up Get having out. family we had this too. we had this uh communist on we she uh fused uh not to go into oh, the story boy. again but she uh like said like she was like talking about the oh. bourgeoisie and she said i'm so sorry love that your family were bourgeois <laughs> and that they should have been executed by this the noble Soviets. i mean or, that's that's <laughs> the position that's like why they left right i'm just saying like you know not everyone has the ability like was in situated yeah. to be able to leave the country not everybody, but quite a bit of people were who, uh, you know, they did have to have certain families here. I know that uh, Jewish people had families here that uh, could uh, get them out of that situation. But also Russia at that time, like we were talking about, like, oh, the CIA was like being so hard on uh, the Russian Empire. The Russian Empire, that's what I'm going to call it, the Soviet Empire during that time. That's the right way to think of it. That too. is, Yeah, that, that is the right way. So that empire at that time, it had all this territory that it conquered. Yet at the same time, the big cities that you would expect to perform the best, people couldn't get basic necessities because the economy of all uh, of all of it was screwed up. And I still wonder if if not for the Americans, if not for things like Star Wars, like the uh, like the situation in Afghanistan that the Soviets were drawn into, if not for that, could the Russian Empire still have existed today, much like North Korea exists, and still kept a lot of people under their thumb? But the thing is, like the Russians had to like like blow all their cash on trying to outcompete the exactly. Americans. Exactly. That's why exactly. they had no yeah. cash left for you. So I mean, it's like a. You had you had, exa- you had an example that was Belarus, but it's falling apart now. Mm. Another Belarus, question I would want to Belarus ask: Belarus has become really bourgeois, and they they did done well, and now they don't want Lukashenko any longer. So that's the answer to that question. Mm. That I think is the real end of the Soviet Empire. It's happening right now. But it's still not so much an example of uh, well, the Russians they were spending all this money on the military, so they couldn't afford this uh, basic stuff. This was even before Star Wars. If we're talking about the condition that most Russian people were living in, like sure, you could say the oil crisis had a lot to do with it as well. But it's some kind of system that I think, on one hand, it wasn't sustainable economically but on the other hand Mm. this unsustainability all it really resulted in is just more people living in a miserable life where you know they i've got it i got a theory for you that i'm working on at the moment you remember when you see dictators on posters they always look like old women rather than men Mm, maybe strangely effeminate (laughs) about dictators like 
They want to claim both the magical and the phallic power at the same time, or at the greedy. Well, that, that's how it goes. No, that was like the first depiction of at, Christ in the ancient at, world, by yeah, the way. Look yeah. at Leonid Brezhnev. Like, if you look at Leonid Brezhnev in 1960s and forward, the Soviet leaders look more and more feminine. Look at look at Gorbachev. He was a woman. He was just an old lady. Well, old Trump Catholic. is a uh, Trump is an old Jewish lady. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> he's an aggressive lady though. He's he's a feisty lady. He's a TV show star. Come on. He's an Italian he, grandma. He's a real yentl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's grandma. energetic. But okay, these were like. These were just wooden ladies. You, you remember it, the, the really funny one was when the East German dictator and, and, and the Russian Soviet dictator kissed each other. You know, that's one of these sort of iconic pictures. That it looked like two old ladies kissing each other. And there's something about dictatorships that if dictatorships are actually inherited and they try to pretend they're monarchies, you eventually get these sort of incredibly effeminate, obese, like Kim Jong-il now in North Korea. When you get to the I third think, generation, it's just obesity, diabetes, and they die when they're 35 or something. I, it, think, I um, think that's what happened in the Soviet Union. It was so dysfunctional because it was so poorly led. It was so poorly directed. It was, it was, just, it was just completely, it was just a fantasy land when nobody it was believed it. You know what's funny? I think that Camille Paglia kind of beats you to it because when she is describing, uh, and again, this was a, a bit major part of my essay reviewing this gallery, Abortion is Normal, where Paglia, she describes uh, during the Desaad chapters in Sexual Persona, where she talks about the uh, female uh, trans transvestite, where you have this like weird perverse power that is both masculine and feminine, but it's a corruption of both. And she says that a lot of secular millenarian totalitarian ideologies within the 20th century, they had this like Desaudian uh, aspect of domination that isn't eroticism. This is again, going back to Horkheimer and Adorno. This is more like the logical progression of post-enlightenment instrumental reason where domination is tied into this perverse psychosexual uh, mm -hmm. androgyne, you know, what yeah. the symbolist painters were painting, or, but it's a perversion yes. of the androgyne. So. so watch out for the priest who tries to be the king. That's where you get Adolf Hitler. So the Adolf Hitler mm. character is a voyeur. He, he, yeah. he had a girlfriend, she was a whore, and she fucked all of the leaders of the Nazi party, and he probably jerked off. That's how you couldn't get to him. You couldn't get to him. Watch but then the again, I'm kind of history. skeptical they of those stories about Hitler. Be like, they say he was gay, and they say no, he, he was wasn't. He wasn't. Like, no, no, no. Look at the stuff. pattern. Do you go back and look at the whole pattern of his personality? And of course, he kills himself at the end, and he's ethically correct. He says that the Russians beat us to it. We're inferior to the Russians. I will do what all Germans should do. I will kill myself. So, you know, it, he stayed with his ethics all the way through. Well, it's, a typical, it's a typical ethics, very similar to Pol Pot in Cambodia when he started the characters. I don't, I don't know if we got his body, though. That's mystic. the thing. Like, how accurate is the fact that he killed himself as opposed to running away to, like, a... Uh, um, um, so the South America or Antarctica or no, boys this, in Brazil. When I get into the controlled demolition. No, when I get into when I get into North when I get into yeah, North America. chilling in the Caribbean with Tupac and Elvis. When I get one into one of the best comments. Is if there is, I'm out of the discussion. I'm out. I'm out. One of the best <laughs> comments I ever saw. Conspiracy the theories are astrology with testosterone. That's all they are. Nothing else. Well, one, at least one, there's one, a so testosterone is... part, which, as you talked about before, is missing in today's society. So those are kind of the things. No, no, but here's the thing. I would push back. Yeah. I, I would say that conspiracy theory, this is what I argued against. I believe it was some fucking journalist that he's a rat, whatever. I was uh, I was subtweeting this person, uh, it's not like quote tweeting, where I, I my thesis, and I, I want to write about this, conspiracy theory is a perfectly valid uh, political ontology in a world of increased hiddenness and concealment in uh, the techno capital apparatus that we're existing in. I think that conspiracy theories are perfectly valid, but I d disagree with the sense that a lot of people, as much as I love him, he's my boy, Alex Jones. Uh, I disagree with him because a lot of conspiracy theories set it up where, you know, the conspiracy happens, uh, it's political domination, but there's like this greater liberty that the conspiracy is corrupting. I don't agree with that. I think that conspiracy goes way, much back, you know, much, goes back, you know, much more than we realize. And there isn't this sort of like angle. It starts with Protestantism. Ground. What, what would you say? It starts with Protestantism. There's a, that's like yes. where all the, uh, the uh, like Illuminati and everything comes from like Protestant, like yeah. researchers. And then, and, and you yeah, see the Bill Cooper, like Bill Cooper took on from like, the, the Protestant kind of like writers about corruption of, of, of like, uh, from the Protestant Baptist perspective. 
And that's where Alex Jones comes from. Like yeah, Alex the Jones very falls after Bill Cooper. And, Protestant. Yeah. 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 But another funny thing is uh, one of the funniest comments I ever read on YouTube was under the uh, song by Slayer. Uh, Angel, uh, I believe it was Rain and Blood. And he said that uh, this was Hitler's favorite song. He got to he got to hear it before he died in 1993 because it came out in 1990. So he died in South America in 1993 and he was a fan of Slayer. So that was one of the funny comments I saw. About that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But go I think Hitler killed himself because he was bored with everything and finished his work. So that was his project. No, but 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 see, this is another thing that we could talk about on a serious note. Would be the, um, the the not the you know what Benjamin he he said that uh, you know the difference was the communists like the left wing they have this like um, politicization of, of of aesthetics and art, but the but the you know fascist and the new right well the right wing they have this sort of. Uh, aestheticization of art so I, I i don't know as as i i feel that the, the the latter is somewhat more coherent because like for example in these millenarian fascist dictatorships you had this sort of not a political project per se but an aesthetic project an art project i feel that uh the only way in my opinion aesthetics and art can survive in the 21st century is if we have this aestheticization of politics. We have now that. The it's political... called Call of Duty. Well, maybe, maybe. I don't know. But I... where, where do you guys see uh, the direction of art in the modern world and where do you see the direction of the contemporary art world? Because to me, I think that like academia, like politics, hopefully, fingers crossed, the art world totally fucks itself over and it just crumbles and topples over. But that's sort of like an optimism that I feel is um, unwarranted. Right. Think about this, Gio. Think about this, Gio. So right now, right. museums across the world are selling off their holdings to billionaires to right. stay open. Right. So that's the real future of the art world is that all Holy the old shit. art that everyone wants to see is going to be owned by billionaires, just like <laughs> it is in like Children of Men. Uh, I knew you were going to say you'll that. Be able that's so sad. And then you'll be able to go to the museum to see whatever like current grift is operating on like the elite. So at a certain point, like I kind of like and also hate contemporary artists because their only job really is to just grift off of rich people. Like the, everything else in between it has been shorn away. There was always that element of seeking patronage when it came right. to making art. But now that itself is the art form. Like, what if me and Gio don't make money? <laughs> <laughs> then that's fine. No, no I'm, I, I'm saying that's fine. Like you can make art and stuff, but like right. you, it, you're not going to yeah, be like. You're talking about art, matter. art as this, yeah, art as discourse according to the New York Times. I mean, it's way more than that. So I'm interested in architecture, and I think architecture is the golden age. I'm working with the Saudi architects in London. I think I think there's a golden age because of AI, because simply with AI added, you, you this is where I'm interested in symbiotic transcendence. What do you mean AI symbiotic added? Ability. Like what do, you, what do you mean by AI? So symbi symbiotic, intelli symbiotic intelligence means that you mix AI and cr human creativity. So you mi mix the two. For what example, if you're going to design a sky... Okay, if you design a skyscraper and, and you can just tip it like that within a second, you know exactly how much more that would cost and what other materials would require and how much longer or shorter it would take to build the building. So you would basically look at okay, the reality of actually constructing this building, the engineering part of it is something I can actually see while I'm designing the building. This will revolutionize architecture enormously. This is a perfect example of symbiotic transcendence. And I think the most creative brains on the planet will certainly be hired to do it because of what I expect it to be as aesthetically pleasing as possible or, or fascinating or whatever. Again, it will be billionaires and new super class, et cetera, who, who, for, who could afford to show off by doing these different things. So yeah, I think architecture is a golden age ahead of it simply because it can be more more creative than ever at a lower cost and it will be the new major artistic expression. So if you're going to do like, patronage for the wealthy, you might as well build skyscrapers mm -hmm. while you do it. But look at all well, the ridiculous like things saying, though, But it, it sounds like what he's saying is yeah. like, okay, we have computer modeling and this enables us to create more interesting uh, buildings. It doesn't sound, yeah. I, don't know, I don't see where AI comes in here. Yeah. It's just like, well, okay, you can use I can AI. Use Ableton oh, to make a song. Yeah. And I, it, it's it's an AI. interactive relation. It's mm. an interactive. Yes, it is because it's an interactive relationship. But, but so it actually, 
Would you I'm skeptical because I'm a big proponent of traditional art. I don't know. I, I mean, I when think, the human factor comes uh, in, if you look at so many monstrosities that are being built today that don't subscribe to sacred geometry, they look, you know, they just look silly, like putting a butt plug in the middle of Paris, France, something like that. Like, there are people who want to do that, and they like the idea of creating chaos, just like, for example, the protesters that took down the statue of Teddy Roosevelt. Instead of that, they put in place some weird-looking deer that did not look half as beautiful as the statue that was there before. So it's almost like these little kids who are saying like, no, we can do better. Let us do it. Let us do it. Meanwhile, whatever well, they're doing it is like so much uh, worse. But here's the know. thing, Lev. Here's the thing. You know me. I'm a big proponent. Not proponent, but I'm, I'm a respecter of contemporary art. And I do think a lot of contemporary artists are doing things interesting with technology. But I, I, I'm, what I mean by traditional art is that I'm, I'm a fan of traditional art making. I don't agree that AI and technology in, in the digitality of art will come about and completely destroy uh, painting and printmaking. And I, I think that the, the sort of claims that AI and technology is going to come along and destroy art in general is sort of bullshit. It's sort of like the nerd transhumanist fantasy, like the, 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 the AI programmer nerd. He was like, oh, well, you don't have to do real art anymore because the AI is going to come along and do it. Like, I think that's bullshit. I think no, that no, 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 yeah, I agree, I agree with you. That... Yeah, yeah I, Dio, I'm Dio, that you... that's what pathos yeah. is. Yeah, machines yeah. cannot do pathos at all. Machines cannot crack jokes. Right. Machines will not fuck. They can only do logos. They cannot <laughs> well, do Well, maybe in the Holy Mountain, that's exactly that one machine specialized fucks, so. in pathos. <laughs> and by the way, we have a comment from Gibson. Joel Davis' ah. disgust meter is at 78%. Joel, is that accurate? <laughs> Well, I know, I don't know, we don't really know now at the end of this conversation any more than when we began, really, I think where history and en has ended or not, but I think the stream oh, I has it. ended. I think, the, I think the stream has ended pretty much. So maybe history hasn't, but let me, I, I can wrap it up has. for you, man. We'll end it. We'll end history. Right yeah, let's here do now. it. Let's Go do for it. it. All right. So if we're going to say that the end of history is at any single point, because Jeff says it's still Hegel realizing with Napoleon that the Napoleonic code was like the end point of the master slave dialectic. We're still there. No one has suggested that we're going to eliminate the concept of human rights or that we're going to bring back a master society or we're going to bring back slavery or that any of these things are going to go away, right? I mean, some people believe we should take these things away, that we should return to having masters and slaves and, you know, but it doesn't appear to me that that has any future barring some like massive collapse into the conditions of prehistory, at which case we'll just start over. Doomsday optimism, uh, in other words. That just sounds like a dichotomy, though. Like, okay, we're not going to return to some past form, but why can't we progress to something that doesn't fit into either well, of those categories? Well, well, the progression would just be more citizenship, right? It would just be more equity. Well, how do you know? How can you get out in front of all possible vectors? Let's well, suggest and... something else. Well, well, there are two things. One way is what's likely to happen. The other thing is what we want to happen. Can we keep those, the prescriptive and, and the descriptive separate? The descriptive scenario is that the masters are going to go off without the slaves this time around, most of the time. And a lot of people will, be, will, will, miss, will miss slavery because slavery is no longer an option. That's, I think, that, I think, is the most likely scenario. It doesn't mean that I advocate it. I just think it's a likely scenario where we're heading. But we're still going to be slaves to all the uh, dopamine uh, encouraging uh, systems that are going to be around yeah, us. Yeah, we're going to be slaves to things, but we're not going to be slaves in the sense that we can do any sort of meaningful work that has any value. Mm. That's not guaranteed. Yeah, but that's, but that's predicated on people being able to resist wireheading and the wirehead philosophy of just uh, endless pleasure seeking through digital mediation. I feel that maybe the only way out is through. And this is, again, my approach to contemporary art. The only way out is through. So if you, uh, I do agree that returning to some previous order, I don't, I want to hold out and say that there could be a possibility for that, but I don't know. I, I, think I, I, Gio, I think, yeah. I think when you say the only way uh, to go is through, I mean, I think that, I, I think maybe I felt, uh, or maybe agreed with uh, what you were saying in the past, but I, I think now um, the problem is that the circumstance that I think we're in has eliminated the possibility of even achieving the understanding of something from like the past in which can be True. returned to yeah. or even replicated. And whenever you go through like the kind of position that we're in now, it will just completely really deteriorate like whatever system or, or, or like, reaction that you want to have to it because it's it's going to be only if 
at le- most a metaphorical like uh, connection that you can make to the thing yeah, in which you choose to react. You're completely correct with this. I think, like to get all slow to die and like we're kind of out of the womb and there's no climbing yeah. back in at this point. But 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 in terms of right. of, of there being like another um, alternative to um, like citizenship and and global human rights and that being the kind of underpinning of the way in which human action can take pl- like because that's the point i'm assuming right logo is that that once you are the citizen it, it it this is like kind of uh the way that you can contr- uh, control human, human you have action. legal rights you can you can sue people who have wronged you who have are of a different class stature Mm-hmm. Like that's a major. Yeah, there's like antitrust law is like probably one of the best examples. So, yeah, and how so many, how many antitrust suits have, have happened in the exactly. last few decades? No, so like that's where it does they have been successful. There have been antitrust. That is, that is where that is where history can actually happen is when you're aiming yeah. to create more equity in the situation we have amongst citizens. Citizen equity is the future of history. That's the only feasible change you can make that will actually benefit people number one and number two it's the only one that can is like actionable like i would say that torts and and antitrust lawsuits actually have succeeded and made an impact That's, a lot of the times antitrust lawsuits though are like no constructed no in a way to to make they, there have richer, been antitrust so. lawsuits that have succeeded i mean they, yeah but a lot of antitrust uh, lawsuits are just yes. a way for like i've got this really expensive business that's like a multinational corporation the that I can't sell. Made all their money. So, so, yeah like i can't sell it so i'll just do an antitrust on it and then yeah, give me the money like <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's gaming the system it's no what it's more yeah. about is is about redistrib like I, i'm sorry to be the marxist here i guess but it's just like the future is who's gonna give you like getting more money to more people that's it Gives me that the future is good. It's not even Absolutely. about. I think, I think it's a lot more complicated. Oh, that than that, but okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's it really is because it, it like you're talking about these attention economies and stuff like this, but it's not like you're. I don't believe this thing, this idea that the attention matters more because you can garner a lot of attention and you ultimately end up making more money for the platforms that host. No, 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 no. You're you missing the point. Yourself. You are. You've decided you're gonna end up with the money in that equation anyway. You got to. No, you gotta, I didn't. I didn't decide. Attention it. means that all the attention goes to whoever is considered the highest quality in any system. So any system what's, that wait, starts sorting what, information. What's considered the highest quality? Students, algorithms decide that depending on how you direct algorithms. If you keep the algorithms free and open, they will certainly do that. You cannot pay your way because any algorithm is built on the awareness multiplied with credibility equals attention. attention. How does advertising oh, work? Wait, wait, logo. logo advertising talk- doesn't work. Advertising yeah, does. is dead. No, no it's called it spam. Works. It's no. dead. No, 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 no. Dead. That's not real. That's why they go woke now. They can't. Th- no. Advertising does not work. This is where you're wrong. Advertising it's dead. absolutely works. No. Logo, the no, example none of, of us advertising. makes decisions based on advertising. Okay, so ever everyone research. who spends money on advertising is just being They're is desperate. Can I, can I actually give an example of advertising market. working? Can I give an example of advertising working? Good so, point. when Dave Chappelle came out with his most recent special, you're as a company, you're able to pay to have uh, Rotten Tomato reviews suppressed. So, they decided to have only the zero percentage star like reviews available to contribute to the like tomato meter. And then they paid for a trending story on, on Twitter and the entire, like, and, 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 uh, and everybody on like my side of Twitter was like, Oh my God, I can't believe the left is attacking Dave Chappelle, a true comedian. Wait a second. You know I mean? said like, so I'm saying that did actually get people to watch Dave Chappelle and yet. it worked. These are algorithms that are manipulated by politics and corrupted by money. They will lose out eventually. The free and open algorithm will mm. win the digital war. I don't, I don't know. That's it. kind of sus. I don't know. I have a free and open algorithm by definition. Spam. Algorithms are closed systems. No. Yeah. Algorithms. If you and I, Joel, want to create a pure communication between us without interference from fucking Google or Facebook, we will create a free and open algorithm that will go towards the highest quality according to our no one will use it. anything we search. No, but no one will use it, but also they will they have sufficient. That was the of Google algorithm until they corrupted it. That's search. how it worked the first 10 yeah. years. That's how Google search worked and what's going but down then, now. No, but then Google had such a such a wide platform and they own so much. That yeah, they could just rearrange what a good search means. They changed your mind. 
That's like, why we're leaving Google everyone search uses and it. going to DuckDuckGo and anywhere else. And we'll go on That's Gab. Going we'll go on Gab and we'll go on Bing. We'll go on Bing. Like, we'll look, go look, on all those You can so go on lost. Parler and you can get banned. For, uh... I'm sorry, but Amazon owns Twitch. They're not going anywhere. Amazon. You're too American. Anywhere. You guys Google's are too. Not going so anywhere. Fucking stuck with American capital. Spotify is not as going the anywhere. Only ideology. Apple isn't exist. going anywhere. Microsoft isn't going anywhere. So oh, I, I want I want to share Alexander's power. optimism, but I it's called that... spam. We hate it. It's called ad blockers. Ad blockers are fantastic. Yeah. So now you use native kill advertising. advertising. What's native kill advertising? advertising. Mike, well, well, you're creating point. stresses that force advertising the advertising system over. to mutate and adapt to a, a new exactly. environment, but oh. it will keep yeah. adapting. I was talking so, with yeah, my it friend. Can't. It's, 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 it's more a, and more It's a parasitical it's vermin that will just keep no, fucking with no, us. No, it will not. Only for the underclasses. The upper classes, that's exactly what an upper class is. An, an upper world. class is not this. We the, throw oh, away the, snobs. the advertising. The snobs. He were. throws away the ads. Look, he's a snob. No, but it's not it even out. related <laughs> to money. It's not related to money because I know someone from the National Arts Club. I looked at her laptop and I saw she did not have ad blocks. So all her videos just kept getting these ads. And like, this is someone from like the high point of society, yet she does not have an ad block or she endures all these stupid fucking ads. So there no, you but, go. But, it's but, not but a matter of money. That, but the nature of advertising itself has changed because um, that's why it's woke now. That's why it's desperate. No, but, oh, it's but, but it's like communication. No, but it, yeah. but if people I, I, try to sell you a madras <laughs> in Manchester by claiming they're building bakeries in Burundi. That's how fucking delusional they are now. No, but it's people true. No, but here's this is my point. It's just, it's just a game that's over. Al Alex, this Bam. is my point. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you because even Baudrillard said this, I believe it was in uh, The Vital Illusion, where, you know, it hit me when I read this passage. I forget it now, but where it's the corporate, when it comes to the corporatocracy, when it comes to capitalist realism, it's no longer about uh, the product being sold. It's rather the uh, identity and the signifiers that a corporation can sell to you. So, for example, I remember watching this one commercial uh, it was, you know, about Black Lives Matter and it was like about how society is changing and how great it is. And at the very end, I discovered that it was an old Navy commercial. No mention of a Geo, it's over. Shirt. Geo, Geo, the airspace above Europe after the corona will be owned by two companies called Ryanair and Wizz Air. They do best product at best possible price and they don't do Black Lives Matter or any of this woke shit. Red, no, but my, Red, the point being Red Bull pulled out and threw out the entire North American office when they gave money to Black Lives Matter. Said, They're advertising to you by being based. Soda. <laughs> <laughs> We, we will have based corporations. Who we'll, will, have, uh, we'll have we'll SJW have corporations. We'll have base corporations, red pilled corporations, blue pilled we'll corporations. Yeah, we'll have. Yeah, no, yeah, the, yeah. the thing with, I'm, with, with I'm making a clear pilled corporation, in fact. Logo, a clear logo, I'll tell you why. Logo, I'll tell you why. My most expensive oh. speech, and we're talking here tens of thousands of dollars. My most expensive speech is one I give only to German marketing people. It's called Marketing is Dead. Get over it. And they pay me to tell them they're over. Yeah, because that's they don't. That's the end of history. That's, right? Yes, right. exactly. That you're so right that that's the end of history because you made yeah. money doing that. <laughs> <laughs> We're all. Did you also, advertise no, them I'm also like, hey, I got like doing a speech to, to people I about the end of the market. Money. Like, I didn't need the money. I was Lenin I'm who not, sold them the okay, fucking. Okay, okay, that I'm not okay. calling. I'm, dude, I'm saying that how what Holy would you describe shit. a situation in which you can give a speech to marketers that they pay you for and which you say your jobs are actually over and they go, wow, that re it really makes me think. And then they go to work the next day. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Germans. when they had movie day at offices where they in the mid 90s and they showed office space and some people got up and quit after they saw office space. I believe that that's what the movie was called. I But I don't know. I feel that. But, but again, critique is able to be commodified. I mean, look at the punk movement. Look, I, I, I just don't think though, I, however, I do not believe in the current paradigm that we're in of woke capital, that they're going to be rival corporations that are like, I don't know, giving sponsorship to uh, like ethno capital versus causes. woke capital. I don't believe. Yeah, Red like Bull did already. Uh, yeah, they, already that's already. Did. See, look, he's excited. Coinbase did yeah. that already. <laughs> no, but Coinbase was just trying to be apolitical. It's not. We're gonna be. No, we're gonna get no. It. They we're killed. Get they white sent. To come they to wanted to get rid of their woke not, staff. <laughs> that's what Google and Twitter don't dare to do. Coinbase got rid of all the fucking woke staff that. Yeah, and Alex, you just seem somebody. you seem really concerned that neoliberalism isn't efficient enough because it's incorporating all these diversity things, which make it less meritocratic. I so have no idea I don't, what neoliberalism is. That, I don't use the word. I, I okay, fine. Word. 
it just seems it just seems Nobody's like Nobody's defined it to me. I don't know what it you means. Just want to preserve bourgeois liberalism. <laughs> I, don't make feel... descriptive from prescriptive again. I I am a strict Nietzschean. I love phallic power. A bourgeois love... liberal. <laughs> I'm like Paglia. Okay, I'm Paglia with a penis. Another you know, bourgeois oh. liberal, but yeah, no, that's. Oh fine. my I'm god, Logo, you're it. killing me, Logo, you're killing me. I think I, I get. Listen, Logo, I get what you mean about um, a lot of these forces that are seemingly uh, challenges to the current neoliberal order. They're not. They can be. They can become re-territorialized they, because the current system, you know, again, using Foucauldian terms, is very good at testing resistances and incorporating them into the corpus of the states of exception that liberalism relies on to exist. So for example, if there was enough, I don't know, it, we went to some like Scythian war, warlord model, I don't know, there will be like corporate fucking advertisements for the the, the next uh, Italian futurist rifle that can kill mm -hmm. the undesirable. I don't know. It's just, oh wait, we have a comment. I, I, I don't know, Logo. I, we had a comment from yeah, Juggs ahead, earlier sorry. on. So <laughs> Juggs asks, what does Logo even believe in? What what does that mean? Uh oh, I don't I don't know. People always say nothing, that. nothing. I don't know what nothing at all. <laughs> it's like, nothing at all. No, I, listen, listen. I would I I would also say I believe in suspending my belief towards like like you know like I he's I agree. An, he said uh, you're an empiricist then right? That's that's Me? just sexist empiricus right? You know uh, uh, what is it? Ephoria, apophoria. I, I didn't know it was from, from Sexus Empiricus, but it's just like, I personally, it's just like people have this idea that things have to take that. Like one should operate from basically like a constitution. Yeah. I mean, I'm, what I'm saying is what I believe in is getting more money to more people. Ultimately. Like, I think that logo is a wait, 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 wait. I thought, I thought you were saying that the, 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 the Kojev, I mean, I haven't read Kojev, but from the way you explained it, it seemed to be, you have this dichotomy between equivalence and equality and, you and, and equity. And equity, sorry, equivalence and equity, and you and you and you and you side with equity against equivalence, but isn't like subordinating everything to some kind of monetary instrument? Equivalence it's too, it's pi too late. It's too late. We're already all subordinated to economics. Okay. Oh, so you just like you just, like, like, you're just going all in with equivalence, like fuck equity, basically. I mean, like, we're all fuck. saying there's no way out but through, and then it's just like let's okay, so let's get equity. Like, okay, we have all these major corporations. Let's all have equity in it. Like, if we're going to have... That's called Saudi Arabia. Go there and see what That's happens. That's what I'm saying. They're like, like okay. They're 29 like, years old, got diabetes and die from corona when they're 29 instead of 79. That's what happens in America Arabia. right now. Yeah, I know. I don't know. I'm kind of skeptical. Wait, Kyle know. Napoleon is asking, what is it? I think it's a psyop. Uh, it is the end of history. And the end of history is spelled Saudi Arabia. And mm -hmm. that's what happens when you give universal basic income to people. It fucks them up completely. That's not Marxism at all. That's just. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not saying that's universal basic income. That's cattle humanity right there. I'm not saying but universal basic, basic income. That is a step in the direction towards what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the GDP of a country should be redistributed to the citizens. That's like boring. Logo, Logo, what do that's you mean? That's boring. Oh, wait, wait. You were, you were <laughs> showing for boring. Andrew Yang a few months ago. We have another no, comment yeah, because he's because he's talking about equity. We have another comment from Jugs. To be yeah. fair, I've had productive conversations with Logo when he's sincere and talks about film and art he likes. But I'm seeing a different person here. People don't people don't like when I when I'm just asking like, what is the point of this? Why is what is this challenging? Is this any different from what we have? See, what the, does this even see, mean? To here, the, to here someone? we go. Why? Uh, what is the difference between what we have? And this may not be something that you mean right now, but this was something you were talking about before, where you were saying that the situation that's going on in Russia is equivalent to what's going on in America, which, again, it's a very old... I'm not saying entire, equivalent. You're I'm saying it's, it's, a, it's, it's similar. Similar. It's very, like... Again, a everything lot of everything is happening is similar. Yeah, exactly. Yes, every, everything That's all is I'm similar, saying. but there should be certain standards that we can judge one thing Wait against a second. another. Wait, two. This is a repetition of the same. Is Joel still bored? Joel, what's yeah. up? Yeah, What's I'm, I'm getting more bored. <laughs> okay, should we, should we finish this okay. and make it? I am yes. not a Rawlsian to the commenter. Yes. Not Lev, a Rawlsian. I love you Thank guys. God. I love, I love you too. We do it. Logo, we please to, unblock me. Logo, please me. unblock me. Yeah, Logo, uh, unblock me. Logo, yeah, I don't know, unblock. I, don't know I love Logo. Logo. I love Logo. Yes, Logo's great. Thank we you. all love Logo. I love tricksters. All right, guys. So this is it. We are going to say our goodbyes. But before that, I just want to say we are going to have a free-for-all Friday coming up tomorrow. 
and we are going to have Clausington. I feel like I just I need a cigarette right now. If you yes, know what I mean. we're yeah, going to have Clausington. Right. Oh, guys. Crap. We're going to have Jugs. We're going to have Disco Orpheus. My brain has been fucked out of me. I'm we sorry. We are going to have Haka Says. We're going to have Mimi Bear. So Mimi's coming back. We are going to oh, have my... crowdfunded on government. He's coming back. We are going to have MK Ultra JC Denton. He's coming back. We're going to have a uh, delivered Morgan. Uh, Morgan the buff trad man he's coming back so that is free for all Friday that's going on tomorrow we're going to talk about that statue that's being built in New York City right now uh, I mean that was transported oh. there the uh, Medusa oh. the Medusa statue so that and I'm be and I'm going to make I'm going to make a product announcement anybody wants to buy Hunter Biden crack cocaine from Ukraine can buy it from me <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Please That's, buy my no, It doesn't look that good. Room. I mean, if he can fall That's asleep with the crack pipe in his mouth, it can't be that pure, you know. It's... <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's corrupted. Yeah. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, this is it. I just want to say. Hopefully, hopefully all everyone comes again. This has been amazing. Yes. All of you. I love it. I love it. Yes. yes. Alex, John Palich. Oh, my God. I, and I'm you just, people I'm... who are watching this, please wow. subscribe, subscribe, and subscribe. Because we are going to have way more of these amazing conversations. We're bringing everybody together. This is the power of the time right now where even though. You know, it's not a great time to be alive. It is a very fascinating time to be alive that we are able to have these conversations. So thank you, everybody, for watching. I love you all. I feel like we went on a beautiful. journey together. Which thank you, Lev. Thank you for having me on. Take care. Thank you so much, John. T take care, everybody. I love you. Subscribe and go to patreon.com slash break the rules. Become a patron. Become a patron. Become a patron. 